308 Board of Education meeting. Can I have a roll call, please? Mr. Bauman? Here. Mrs. Doyle? Here. Mrs. Kroner? Here. Mr. Lightfoot? Present. Ms. Morgan? Here. Mrs. Moyer? Here. Mrs. Swanson? Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I would like to welcome everybody who is personally in attendance at tonight's school board meeting. As we stated on the board agenda, this meeting is open to the public in accordance with phase four guidance issued by the Illinois Department of Public Health and the Illinois State Board of Education. We are all social distancing per the guidance and all individuals are required to wear a face covering at all times while in the building. We will be accommodating those who can't wear a mask by live streaming this meeting at www.sd308.org. Also, if anyone would like to make a public comment to the board, but can't do so in person because of the mask requirement, you may always submit a comment in writing ahead of the meeting, and your comment will be read during the public comment section of the meeting. The directions to submit a written public comment are listed at the top of the meeting agenda. We certainly recognize that wearing a face mask for long periods of time is inconvenient and sometimes uncomfortable. However, it does provide the best known protection against giving the virus to another person and it will be required of all individuals during this meeting. If anyone needs a break from wearing a mask during the meeting, please feel free to go outside for a break and take your mask off as you continue to remain six feet apart from the others. Just put your mask back on before re-entering the building. Please understand that we will be monitoring the building and will be asking anyone without a mask to put one on or to leave the building. We appreciate everyone's understanding and willingness to abide by these expectations for our collective safety and health. Thank you. Moving to item 4.1, the public hearing for show, for this, on the state waiver application for show choir. We're going to have two opportunities for public comment tonight. The first opportunity will be during the public hearing on the show choir waiver application, and the second opportunity will be during the public comment portion of the meeting. If you wish to make a comment about the show choir waiver application, please make it during public comment portion of that hearing. If you wish to make a comment about some other matter unrelated to the public hearing, you may do so during the second opportunity for public comment. This is the public hearing convened by the Board of Education of Community Unit School District 308 regarding the show choir state waiver application. Faith Dahlquist, Associate Superintendent for Educational Services, is with us this evening and will present an overview of the district's waiver application and the submission and approval process going forward. After the overview, the members of the Board of Education and members of the district's administrative team will be invited to ask questions and share their thoughts. Then, members of the public will be invited to comment on the application. At this time, I will ask each member of the Board of Education the Associate Superintendent for Educational Services, and the district administrators who will speak to identify themselves for the record. Faith Dahlquist. Tony Morgan. Brent Lightfoot. John Sparlin. Lori Doyle. Matt Bauman. Heather Moyer. Ruth Croner. Maureen Lemon. And now I will ask that Faith, Mrs. Faith Dahlquist present her overview of the district's show choir waiver application. Thank you. Starting in the 2019-20 school year, Oswego uh, High School students participated in IHS athletics or the high school marching band had the opportunity to request and utilize a physical education waiver. The 
physical education waiver exempts a student from participating in physical education and places the student into an academic study pe period or study hall. The purpose of the state waiver application request is for the opportunity for high school students participating in commotion, the Oswego CUSD 308 show choir, to be able to utilize a physical education waiver. The waiver would only be eligible for second semester during their season. There are 54 OHS students that are involved in this and two students from O East. Uh, students eligible for this waiver have a minimum of three rigorous practice sessions for a total of seven and a half to 10 hours per week. And the waiver, if approved, would allow these students to schedule a study hall similar in practice to the commitment and marching band. This application would be in place for five years, and the state waiver application is for a waiver of a school code to allow Oswego Community School District to exempt students in ninth through 12th grade who are active participants in show choir commotion from the state mandated physical education requirement. At this time, board members and district administrators are invited to ask questions of Mrs. Dahlquist. Any questions? More of just a, a, I guess, a comment. So I have no problem with, uh, with us voting to allow this. The, the state allows for uh, this type of organization to um, qualify for a waiver. Um, my statement is more along the lines of, as a board member, I'd like to encourage our students to get more credits, not less credits. And so that I don't know that going into a study hall is uh, the best thing for every student, and I hope they would take that into consideration. Yeah, and some of the stuff that I was reading from the comments that we were given in our email say that, you know, the students are planning to take AP classes or honors classes or other classes, and so I don't think the study hall is the only uh, option that they're going to exercise, right? Correct. At this time, members of the public may make comments. When the secretary calls your name, I ask that you come to the microphone, state your name for the public record, and provide your feedback. Please note that the comments are limited to five minutes per person and that neither the board, nor the administration, nor Mrs. Dahlquist will be answering any questions during this time. Tim Andrus. Ms. Doyle and board, thanks. thank you for the long, tireless work you do in creating a viable school district for our community. I know that many of your choices aren't popular, but necessary for the well-being of the entire district, current and future. I've been a parent supporting OHS's Commotion Show Choir for the last two years. When I first heard of the conditioning work they do, I thought, how hard can show choir be? Then I went to the first competition and learned how demanding the program is. Fast-paced dancing and movement and be able to maintain your voice and breathing for 25 minutes straight, not an easy task. Given the Commotion program is year-round, I think this would be an ideal opportunity to use the PE exemption to provide additional time for the students and save a few dollars for the district. Thank you. Lena Michaelone. I would like to show my support of the PE waiver for show choir commotion. The group is very active and meets eight hours a week, more during competition season, and does rigorous exercise and conditioning in order to support the physical demand of singing and dancing on stage. The extra time for study hall would greatly improve the student's chance at staying academically ahead as rehearsal hours take up much of the student's extracurricular time. Show choir meets from June through March, which is very extensive and dedicates a lot of time and physical exertion performance, even while not during the active competition season. The ruling to give commotion a PE waiver is unarguable. Thank you for your serious consideration of this matter. Pam Roberts. I'm writing in support of the request from ISBE to allow students who participate in commotion to have a PE waiver. My daughter has been involved in commotion at OHS for two years previously, 
and will be singing and dancing again this 2021 school year. The waiver won't benefit her as she is graduating after this school year and already has PE in her schedule. Regardless of that fact, I feel strongly enough about the waiver that I'm compelled to send this email. Commotion is a very rigorous workout of com and commitment of time. The students involved more than fulfill the PE requirement. Thank you for your consideration. Marsha Matson. As a parent to a member of the Commotion OHS show choir, I am fully in support of waiving PE for Commotion members. These kids work much harder than a traditional PE class. In order to sing and dance at the same time, these kids have to be in great physical shape. They have a very strict workout schedule during their three days per week, totaling a minimum of seven and a half hours, usually more, as well as additional workouts they are to perform on non-rehearsal days. The PE waiver would allow these very busy students room in their schedules to fit in additional classes or a much needed study hall so that they can actually get some sleep instead of staying up so late to finish their homework. The additional physical education is not the best use of their limited time given their physical shape and the amount of time they already put into exercise. Thank you for your consideration. Kathleen Goff. I speak in support of the state waiver application request. The show choir students spend a considerable amount of time, seven and a half to 10 hours weekly, all year long in after school practice. It's a competitive team. It takes time, commitment, and dedication to compete, just like marching band or an athletic team. As with marching band and athletics, grades must be maintained in order to be a part of the team. For any team, solid grades are and should be the expectation, not the exception. Oftentimes, my student is up two or three hours following show choir practice, making sure his grades are where they need to be. I'm certain you will find many marching band members and student athletes in the same situation. Today, however, our marching band and athletic team members have the benefit of the state waiver, providing team members who need it an academic study period to offset the impact of their weekly practice schedule. The show choir team does not. I ask that our school's show choir team be afforded the same opportunity. Adeline, Adeline Michaelong. Hello, I am a student and this is my second year in commotion. I would like to support the PE waiver. I have done other sports camps in tennis and basketball and the workouts and conditioning we do during rehearsals are equal to or exceed the level done in tennis and basketball camps. Commotion runs from June to March and we put in over eight hours a week. The time is needed to keep me on top of my studies. Thank you for your attention in this matter. Jennifer Rabadon. I am submitting my support for the proposed waiver for show choir participants. Our show choir meets a minimum of three times weekly for about 10 hours. The practices are year round and very rigorous as the students participating need to be able to sing while dancing and performing their nearly 30 minute routine. Our bands, color guard, dance teams, and cheer squads are all exempt for PE during their season and show choir is on par with these activities in how they practice and ultimately perform for their competitions. Braden Harderson. I will be a senior this upcoming year and I am in full support of a physical education waiver for students who participate in commotion. Commotion is a show choir that I've been part of for years and I find is very important to me. Not only does this group help each other grow mentally, but also physically. In a standard commotion rehearsal, we start by a simple warm up to get ready. We play the song, Come On Eileen, while doing jumping jacks, high knees, and jumping lunges. After this, we play the song, I Feel For You, by Shaka Khan, while doing the same ab workout that is done in the advanced dance class and the dance team at OHS. This workout consists of various types of crunches and V-sits. Once this is over, we run a track throughout the locker pods of the school. Starting at the choir room, jogging down to the first pod, shuffling through rows of lockers, up the stairs, running across to the next set of stairs, going down, then right back up, grapevining through the next pod, 
running to the next set of stairs, down, up, then to the next set of stairs, and from there, it's a sprint back to the start to do the track all over again. We run this track anywhere from three to five times, sometimes singing while we run. As if we weren't winded enough at this time, we use an exercise die to do some extra calisthenics. We typically roll the die eight times. All these various workouts have helped me improve physically. My mile time has shortened by a minute and a half, my sit and reach is improving with every test, and my pacer score keeps getting higher even with asthma. Needless to say, this group can give the workout of a lifetime and help steer people into the best shape possible for that individual. I thank you for your time reading this email, and I hope you really consider the option of a physical education for students in commotion. Laura Shumness. I'm writing to make a public comment in lieu of my personal appearance at tonight's board meeting regarding the possibility of a PE waiver for members of the show choir group Oswego Commotion. My son will be a senior this fall. He has been a singer-dancer in the show choir since his freshman year. I cannot list all of the wonderful things he has learned by being part of this group. I will say, without directly comparing the rigor of workouts directly to other sports within our district, or to some of the actual PE classes offered, which my children have taken, the rigorous physical workouts required by the show choir, along with education about mind-body connection, importance of nutrition and hydration, and education about how being physically fit and healthy improves lung function, breath control, and our body's use of oxygen must certainly meet or exceed the criteria used to award extracurricular sports participants and marching band participants with a PE exemption. The director of the program also requires students to meet IHSA academic eligibility requirements, even though he isn't required to, because he truly believes that ultimately students are students first and athletes second. Show choir rehearsals occur, at minimum, three times per week for two and a half hours each session. These rehearsals occur from mid-June through March each year. Prior to the comp competition season, the students participate in one or two lock-in type rehearsals that run typically for three consecutive days for 10 to 12 hours each day. The competition season occurs from January through March each year and includes a 12 to 15 hour day nearly every Saturday as well as continued rehearsals throughout the week. Often during competition season, extra rehearsals are added in or planned rehearsals are extended in length. The Oswego Commotion is also designed to be a cooperative program open to, both, to students at both high schools, so it would not unfairly restrict students from OEHS from participating. In case I haven't been clear, I strongly support the request for SD308 show choir groups to receive a PE exemption during the spring semester coinciding with their competition season. Thank you for your time. Nicole Torres. I would respectfully ask the Board of Education to pass a waiver for students in Commotion Show Choir to be exempt from PE classes. They practice three times a week for two and a half hours from June through May, so most of the year. They are participating in rigorous physical activity at every practice and frequently more often during competition season. This waiver should be an option for the students who are interested in it, just as it is for marching band and various athletes. Our kids sing in tune while they are dancing, which illustrates their stamina and dedication to healthy movement. Jim Doyle. That's the other Jim Doyle in Oswego, okay. <laughs> Not the one I'm related to. I forgot, there are two Jim and Lori Doyles in Oswego. Oh, wow. Laura, excuse me, sorry. All right, the other Jim Doyle. As the parent of two students at OHS who have been in the, student er, in the school district since kindergarten, I wish to express my support for the pro proposal to offer show choir commotion students the same PE waiver that student athletes and marching band members are offered during their season. 
This would allow students the opportunity to take a study hall period during a season when they have lengthy and physically demanding practices three times a week. Many members of show choir are heavily involved in honors and AP classes and would greatly benefit from room in their schedule for a study hall period to help them maintain academic excellence while they are participating in a school-sponsored activity which meets and exceeds the physical endurance of a typical PE class. I have heard some argue that PE is not just about activity, it is about educating students how to live and maintain a healthy lifestyle. I would respond by pointing out that the waiver would not excuse them from PE completely, merely for one semester during the years in which they are involved with show choir. I would also point out that encouraging students to pursue activities they love, which also demand much of them physically, is indeed teaching them to embrace a healthy lifestyle in the future. Please consider this as you make your decision regarding a PE waiver for show choir equitable to that which has already been offered to student athletes and marching band members. Kim Johnson. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard. The subject matter is regarding commotion receiving the same PE privileges as marching band and athletics at OHS. I'm going to give you my outlook on the situation. Also, I am a parent with two students at OHS and one who just graduated OHS in June. My senior that graduated was an athlete who participated in both halftime and competitive dance for four years, fall and spring, and commotion the whole school year for three years. My junior is an athlete who will be participating in his third year of both football and wrestling, fall and spring. My youngest, who is a sophomore this year, will be participating in commotion all school year for the second year. My kids have been involved in sports, dance, drama, choir, musicals for many years. My husband and I have been extremely involved with our children's activities. My husband is a youth football coach for 10 years now. He also has been featured in a couple of musicals in the Aurora area. He wrestled and was a part of the marching band. Also, I have danced all types, sang, musicals, show choir, been on b-ball and softball teams, and palm and dance teams. I'd like to think that we have had experience in both athletics and show choir slash musicals ourselves and with our kids. Participating in football, wrestling, dance team, etc., may seem to the average person more strenuous of a daily workout or harder athletically be part of those teams than being part of a commotion show choir, but they simply are not. Commotion runs a mile every practice while singing so they can be clearly heard. It takes tremendous abdomen muscles for that. In preparation for their practices, there are mandatory workouts including abs, cardio, and strengthening. My daughter was a commotion dance team captain and honestly would be more excited from a two-hour commotion practice than a two-hour dance team practice. My junior football player and wrestler would, be trying, would try doing these workouts and he couldn't and can't. I'm serious, he could maybe complete half the workout if that. A commotion performance is like putting on an entire musical in 15 minutes. Have you ever seen a high school musical? No joke. I'm not downing athletics, I love them. I'm definitely one of the loudest and top fans at football games, wrestling meets, and dance competitions, as well as commotion competitions. The difference is commotion hasn't been heard. Probably there are not many of you who have seen an entire commotion practice, a commotion competition, or watched them perform at all. These students are athletes. They actually might be more of ones. Commotion has 50 students or more in their group, and if I was a gambler, I'd bet the percentage of AP and honor students are at a very high percentage. Not to mention the amount of high honor roll and honor roll students you would find in the group also is at a very high percentage. Sometimes practices running past 9 p.m. These kids need time to finish homework, complete projects, research, etc., as well as athletes and marching band. There is never a time which entails just singing or just working out or just dancing and performing. 
It's always all of them. Commotion is a regimented and athletic group which definitely deserves to be treated the same as a dance team member, a football player, etc., and receive a study hall instead of PE. These kids work immensely hard, and I know my daughter could have used a study hall. I can't tell you how many hours she spent on homework at night and only sleeping for a few hours before the next school day. So difficult. These commotion students work their you-know-what-offs. Treat the same, the same. They are athletes. Barbara Doyle. Also unrelated. <laughs> As a member of the Oswego Commotion, I strongly urge you to consider granting our group a physical education waiver. Respectfully, I ask that our group may receive the same opportunities that have been provided for traditional sports teams and the Oswego Marching Band. Though unconventional, participating in show choir exerts a lot of physical activity. For the larger part of the school year, our group trains to perform a 25-minute show. Starting in the summer and lasting through the winter competition season, we meet to ensure that each of us will be in the physical shape demanded of learning and performing choreography while maintaining the breath support needed to sing our pieces. To achieve this, we typically begin practice with stretching exercises as a warm-up before running laps. Once everyone has completed their laps around the school, we gather to complete a series of calisthenic exercises, which we aim to carry out in sync. If members of our group fail to execute any exercise in proper form, we repeat the exercise before moving on. The rest of our meetings focus intently on perfecting our choreography and ensuring our vocals are up to par. We encourage each other and work together because we know that the success of our group relies on every member having the strength stamina, support, and capability to perform to his or her full potential. Many members of Commotion are involved in honors, AP, and dual credit classes, as well as honor societies, other school-sponsored programs, and additional activities. Having the option to take a study hall rather than a gym class would therefore be advantageous to our members as it would grant us more time to dedicate to our passionate and commitments. Thank you for your consideration. Next. At this time, I would like to ask our administrators if they have any additional information, documentation, or recommendations that they would like to have before the board while we consider whether to authorize the show choir waiver application. We have no additional information. At this time, we will close the public hearing, but we will keep the record open to allow for deliberations. On behalf of the Board of Education, I would like to thank the members of the community who have spoken here tonight. The Board of Education will review the application and consider the testimony that it has heard today, as well as any additional relevant information it has received. The Board of Education will discuss the application and vote whether or not to authorize the state waiver application during the action portion of this agenda. Item 5.1. Oh. First, I would like to make a motion to close the public hearing. Oh, thank you. Yes. Second. Ms. Morgan. Aye. Mr. Lightfoot. Aye. Mrs. Doyle. Aye. Mrs. Swanson. Aye. Mr. Bauman. Aye. Mrs. Moyer. Aye. Mrs. Croner. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Now on to item 5.1. Public comment. On behalf of the Board of Education, I would like to thank the public for attending tonight's meeting. We value the feedback we receive from our residents and encourage everyone to take an active interest in their public school system. Residents interested in speaking to the board this evening are asked to have completed a comment card and presented it to the secretary to the board before the start of the meeting. When the secretary calls your name, I ask that you come to the microphone, state your name for public record, and provide your feedback. Please note that comments are limited to five minutes per person. We encourage you not to mention specific employees or students by name in your public comment. The board does not participate in discussion or answer questions during public comment. 
Follow-up to your questions may be addressed by administration through the contact information provided on the comment card. Thank you. Connor Frank. Marching band is an important part of many people's lives. I have made many friends in marching band, and I would like to be able to see them for in-person camps in August. There is little reason for us not to have these camps as well. Athletics are having in-person camps, and I do not see a difference between the two. It also seems the district agrees with me as you can get a gym exemption form for a marching band. So I just wanted to bring up this issue and ensure that there will be in-person camps this summer and a marching band season during the school year. Dr. Michelle Ali. I want to thank you all for your time and effort as you coordinate your strengths during the most pressing time in public education history. The weight on your shoulder is enormous. Thank you for your collaboration, perseverance, and receptivity to community feedback. As experienced members of the medical community, we would like to share a few thoughts for consideration at the board meeting on Monday, July 13th. We understand at this time you are in discussion about whether electives will be offered to remote students. It is logical to speculate that a distinction between what is offered in person and at home is a way to streamline and organize responsibilities. There are two electives in particular that we feel may need closer examination, band and choir. Given that we have seen in the hospital setting and what we are continuing to learn about the virus, we are of the firm conviction that band and choir are not classes that should be only held in person. Band and choir are the classes that should be held exclusively online, regardless of the track chosen, in person or remote. Band and choir are not a class in which the governing body guidelines can be implemented in the classroom setting. It would be a rational consideration to offer these classes exclusively in a remote setting for all students to mitigate the risks inherent to these classes. When in band choir class, the majority of students are unable to wear a mask while participating. The nature of the creation of sound acts as a propellant, therefore literally spraying the air with exhaled particles from a group of people. The propelled discharge negates the efforts of a six foot distance and renders all face covering useless. As all community face coverings do not protect the individual wearer, they only protect the other people from the wearer's ex exhalation, and even that is only to a degree. That leaves the instructor as well as all students with or without masks unprotected from the exhaled propellants while class is conducted. This is not exclusive to the band or choir members. Not only are these students and instructors then moving about the building interactively, so is the expelled air. Unless band choir class is held in a negative pressure room where the air pressure is low enough to keep the potentially contaminated air exclusive to that room, then that air will travel through the ventilation system to neighboring classrooms and offices. If band is to be held in a negative pressure room, Due to the aerosolizing nature of the class, prudent responsible practice would dictate that a negative pressure band room would need complete disinfecting in between classes. It goes without say that a projectile aerosolizing nature of the classes inherently puts band or choir students and instructors at exponentially higher risk than any other course. Given that knowledge, District 308 may want to consider a complete risk analysis coupled with a potential disclosure form to band and choir students and instructors of the known escalation and risk for in-person band classes. This disclosure extends to the entire district if the classes are unable to be held in a negative pressure room. Some community members may consider their children at greater risk simply by having a band or choir student in their next period class together, therefore mandating a disclosure form that requires our, all participants to acknowledge that in-person band and choir classes are being held in the building and they are willing to give their informed consent when choosing to send their child to school in person. All of the aforementioned considerations are a risk under the droplet and, and fomite categorization of the virus. You may have heard that an open letter published on July 6 declares the virus to be distinctively aerosolizing, therefore sending infectious particles further than previously believed, now categorizing it as officially airborne further creating the need to readdress current safety guidelines and quite possibly eliminating the opportunity to even hold a music class outdoors, referencing uh, thescientist.com. Another upcoming resource that may be useful as you deliberate is a study outlined in the following link. The study will examine aerosol rates produced by wind instrumentalists, vocalists, and even actors, and how quickly those aerosol rates accumulate in a space. And that's www.nfhs.org. 
band is an exceptional opportunity for a huge number of students in our community. It is not simply an elective. It is years and years of dedication and practice that make up their identity. It is well known to each member of this board that music has exponential benefits for child development, including, but far not limited to, improved SAT scores, increased language and reasoning skills, memory, coordination, work ethic, engagement, discipline, rewards, creativity, and competence. With roughly 2,000 dedicated band students in our community, revoking this option for any of them is not an option and would be an additional and unnecessary emotional hurdle these kiddos to face during such trying times. Through current means, inclusive of Zoom, Google Classroom, and Smart Music, the tools are already available to conduct a band class, take attendance, and assign, evaluate, grade, homework. It isn't ideal, yet none of the upcoming classes are going to be ideal, in person or remote. It is, however, a viable and safe option for all students. Thank you again for your time and consideration of the thoughts brought forth. Kind regards, Drs. Michelle and Mahad Ali. Cheryl Levin. I have a soon-to-be fourth grader at Homestead and a soon-to-be seventh grader at Murphy. <coughs> a significant concern I have is busing. We live in the northernmost part of Will County on the DuPage-Will County borders. Because our area was chosen to be bused all the way to Murphy, even though Benarsic is closer, my almost seventh grader sits on a bus often three to a seat for at least 20 minutes there and tw at least 20 minutes back. It's dangerous to be that close during flu and cold season, let alone during a pandemic. What is planned for those who ride a bus, especially those who are forced to go to a junior high so far away and sit on the bus twice a day for so long? How will they keep socially distanced? And if students are required to wear masks, how will that be enforced by a bus driver whose primary responsibility is to drive the bus? Thank you. Kristen Venopal. If remote learning is happening this year, why aren't the schedules for high school and junior high the same as they would be if they were in school? For example, first period is the same time as if school is in session. They meet with their first period teacher for the entire period or for a reduced time if necessary, then move to second, etc. This way they are touching base with their teachers every day and don't fall behind. If there is going to be half the students at school in attendance one day and half the students at home, can the students at home join a virtual meeting with the teacher at the same time as those that are in session at school? That way content and instruction can continue instead of teachers repeating content. E-learning was new for everyone last year and quick adjustments needed to be made. In the spring, I had three children, all in different schools. My high school student excelled with e-learning and reached out to teachers as needed. She was always an advocate for herself, but became a bigger one during e-learning. There were even times where she was the only student in the meetings with her teacher. My junior high student would finish all his assigned work in 15 minutes and was never getting challenged enough with e-learning. Occasionally, he occasionally had meetings with his teachers, but not enough for him to really benefit. My elementary student struggled and pretty much taught herself. She got frustrated with schoolwork every day. She was getting assignments that she started at 10 o'clock in the morning and wouldn't finish until 10 o'clock at night because there was no real direction. She would reach out to her teacher and she was absolutely wonderful, but there were times other students were figuring out what to do and giving the instruction. When they had their 30 minutes of time twice a week, that was when she excelled the most. My youngest needs in-person learning to be successful. I'm worried with what is in store as school begins this year. We need to set our kids up for success and what we did in the spring didn't work. They should meet with their teachers every day. Equipment should be given to each student so this can be possible. I have friends in other school districts that get Chromebooks, Chromebooks from the school that the kids use throughout their school years. Why can't Oswego do the same? I train associates for a living and I too had to adjust teaching styles for remote learning. I am constantly adjusting methods during class to see what works best for my students, trying to instruct and give them adequate practice time. Also, you cannot guarantee the savviness of the student or parent or teacher when it comes to technology. If e-learning continues, parents, teachers, and students may need a crash course on how to use Hangouts, Google Classroom, or other programs, instead of assuming everyone knows how. The first few weeks of e-learning, when my kids would meet with their teacher, a 20 to 30 minute meeting was taken up by 15 to 20 minutes worth of troubleshooting, especially in the younger grades. I personally would like all my kids to go to school, be present in session each day. I wasn't given that option for high school. I want them to have a sense of normalcy. 
If e-learning has to happen, they need to be with their teachers every day, and there needs to be more changes for the fall. Harry Berenji. I am speaking as a parent of one student at Thompson Junior High and one at Boulder Hill Elementary. While I can't speak for other schools in the district, I have assisted in and been active during regular school at both in the last nine years. While I certainly understand that it will be difficult for most people for many reasons, I would like consideration for e-learning or at least letting parents opt for it for the following reasons. Cases are surging in all the states that fully opened before Memorial Day. Our state opened before 4th of July. This means we have the potential before school even begins for Illinois to start experiencing a surge. Parents are asked to supply classrooms with cleaning supplies and basic items such as tissues on a normal year. I have yet to locate a single cleaning product such as Lysol wipes since March. Parents can't even find appropriate cleaners for their homes, let alone supplying items like this for the school. Another several months of learning from home is less detrimental to their mental well-being than seeing their classmates and teachers getting ill and potentially dying. While kids don't show as much physical symptoms of the virus, they can spread it as easily as lice or the stomach bug. But that's only if your child is healthy. There are many children that would be at a very real risk. I would do anything to keep my children and your children safe. It will be inconvenient for my family, but we will figure out what we must do to keep our children healthy. There is no way to maintain the CDC guidelines for returning to school. Again, I have helped in classes, and there is no way for the kids to sit six feet apart, even if they all keep their masks on without it being legally mandatory. Then we will ask them to sit all day, no cafeteria, assuming no recess like before for the younger children, and in Thompson, the hallways become incredibly packed near certain places that kids not only can't socially distance from each other, but they physically touch. Teachers and staff are not children and will be much more susceptible to the virus. While I would like to see more engagement with teachers during e-learning, they are not our daycares nor responsible for fixing the economy. My vote is for e-learning until a vaccine is available or the cases stop. Thank you for your careful consideration in this matter. Stephanie Austin. Thank you for your time. I feel strongly that there are social distancing issues when you consider daily in-person learning. However, however, every other day schooling is a nightmare for arranging childcare and establishing a routine for children, which studies have proven to be critical to their uh, developmental and emotional needs. I truly wish the district would consider a half-day learning in which the school population would be split between morning and afternoon. It would allow for the same social distancing every other day schedule would, but also allow children and families the semblance of routine critical for the needs of children and also working parents. And speaking with a, a good number of parents, we would have liked to see this proposed as an option. Thank you. Maria Lopez. I am unable to attend your, week, your meeting for work reasons, so I want to comment and perhaps seek feedback as to your plans to open the schools. I am the parent of a Murphy Junior High student. She will be a seventh grader next year. I have a medical condition that puts me at high risk category in relation to COVID-19. Nevertheless, we would send her to school assuming you would implement safety measures and are losing forward the school year. It's a risk for us as a family, but she misses her friends and greatly benefits from instruction from and interactions with teachers. We have seen her flourish at your school. I know it's going to be difficult, year with challenges and potential closings if there are flare-ups in the school or related to school. Please open safely and listen to professional guidance. I will be praying for our school community. Angie Magnuson. Since the upcoming board meeting is scheduled for tomorrow night, I wanted to take a minute just to voice my concerns regarding school reopening this fall. 
I feel very strongly that reopening school in any capacity is a danger to students and to staff. I'm a teacher. I realize the challenges that come with remote learning. The end of the school year was very difficult, but we were all thrown into a situation that we were completely unprepared for and unfamiliar with. We now have more experience and are better able to plan for this type of learning. I also realize that socially it would be good for children to return to in-person learning, but returning to school where they are constantly worrying about staying apart, wearing their masks, and not sharing their materials and taking part in group activities like they used to is not helping the situation. This could cause just as many difficulties as remote learning with the added health risk as well. This is an opinion piece, but brings up many relevant, accurate, and important issues about returning to school in any capacity, reference gadflyontheWallBlog.com. More importantly, these issues would not only prior take priority over our children's health, no matter what guidelines and safety measures are in place. I know firsthand that in reality, these cannot be followed every minute of every day. I am concerned for my daughter's health. I am concerned about what she might bring home to our family. I have a health condition that puts me in the compromised group. The virus has not changed since schools closed in the first place. It is still just as dangerous as ever, and now we are being asked to send out children into buildings with potentially poor ventilation with other children and adults for an extended period of time. There is no way that can be safe. If that wasn't safe in March, why is it safe now? I hope that the safety of the children and staff is put ahead of politics and governmental pressure. We have loved the school district since our daughter started three years ago. I am hoping that these concerns and others like them are truly taken into consideration as decisions are made. Julie Seifert. I know you have an important meeting tomorrow and I thought I'd share some thoughts. I have a fifth grader and a third grader at Homestead as well as a three-year-old preschooler. We have been taking time practicing wearing masks while out and giving six feet of space to those around us. What I'm seeing is that children tend to congregate closely and I'm constantly redirecting them to give space, sanitize, and practice good hygiene. My children have gone through three masks in a couple of hours, which means they will need a bag of several masks for a full school day. This will be a constant battle for teachers. In other families around us, we are observing many are not social distancing or wearing masks while in close proximity to others. This is concerning when considering the very real possibility people will show up to school with the virus. I am a teacher who taught for 12 years before deciding to be a stay-at-home mom and know the immense tasks teachers face each day. And I can't imagine the decisions you are facing in the current situation. For my own children, I won't send them in person this fall if there will be a large in-person class size. In considering the two days in-person elementary option, I wonder what the quality of instruction will be. If a child needs one-to-one -one assistance, how can the teacher provide that from six feet away? What will the classroom and learning environments look like? Will there be a classroom library? Hands-on learning activities? I would love to know this before agreeing to any in-person options. Will bathrooms be sanitized every hour? Parents need a clear picture of the learning environment before agreeing to in-person options. While at home, I cannot provide everything their regular school experience could. I feel it's safest for students and staff to learn from home, but still be connected to the school family, peers, and teachers. I would love to see daily flexible lessons given that parents can easily support at home. I personally don't plan on veering off on my own homeschooling adventure, but I am seeing some parents who are not educators planning their own thing, which concerns me that many students in the district may not be where they need to be academically when this is all over. I would love to see the district, I know there are funding issues, shift efforts for this school year to technology and allocating a Chromebook for each student that will continue with each child year after year. As a parent, I would be willing to pay for this. Add that price onto the registration fee. Any parent who can't afford it can try to fundraise to pay for it and maybe do some large school-wide fundraisers to help those families who can't afford. Thank you for your time. I am thinking of you as you make important decisions that will affect us all. Lori Watts. 
I wish there was a way for me to work from home, seeing students for social work through Google Meets. I am not at all comfortable returning. My daughter-in-law has to have her second brain surgery, and my grandson has spina bifida, which includes immune deficiency. He has fevers multiple times a month and catches everything. My daughter is keeping him home due to the threat. I won't be able to help around if I am exposed. Thank you. Erica Darren. What is going to be a guideline for the staff and students as far as traveling during the school year? Example, traveling to Florida, Mexico, overseas, India, etc. Then coming back to the school immediately after their trip. They should be restricted to return for at least 14 days after their trip and not expose students and staff. CDC states only essential travel at this time, but we know that that is not being followed. Just hoping the district sets a rule for these individuals that decide to leave Illinois. Thanks. Margaret Griest. Will teachers and school staff be COVID tested? If so, how often? If not, why not? Will school staff be monitoring the daily temperature and health screening since the reliability of self-reporting is very faulty given the number of parents who send their children to school sick annually? What is the school community's notification process once a positive COVID case has been identified? Has the district hired contract tracers to handle cases in the school district? What is the level of positivity that will trigger total school closing and a switch to complete remote learning? If a family has a child who fails the daily temperature and health screening, are the other children in that family precluded from attending school as well? For how long will the child and or siblings be, re be required to be out of school? Will those children be able to attend school remotely? If a family learns that a child, teacher, or staff member has tested positive at a given school, can the family opt to keep their child home and exclusively learn via remote learning until the family feels safe enough to send their child back into the in-person learning environment? Has there been any consideration to postponing the start of the school year by a few months till there is a lower number of positive COVID cases and or a vaccine like Arizona? How will the refusal of wearing masks be dealt with when a student arrives at school without one and or a student removes their mask during the day and refuses to put it back on? How will passing periods be handled in order to maintain safe social distancing between students as they move from class to class? There has been a lot of discussion about how the lack of in-person schooling and lack of personal contact with peers can affect our children's mental health. However, what safety nets do you have in place to address the mental health fallout of the unfortunate death of a child's classmate or teacher from COVID if that were to occur? What if a child is experiencing a non-COVID related cough due to a cold, allergies, or any other type of non-contagious illness? Would this condition preclude the child from attending in-person learning? If so, would they be able to attend their class remotely? Will there be a nurse in the building every day for the entire day? What will happen with students who are sent to the nurse with fevers and or COVID symptoms? Will there be dual offices for nurses, one to handle COVID symptoms and another to handle first aid and other health issues? Virus particulates are circulated from toilet flushing. School toilets do not have lids. Who will clean the bathrooms? How will bathroom procedures be handled in general? The CDC guidelines recommend keeping doors propped open. Will COVID precautions overrule active shooter precautions? How should science labs be handled? How will schools be handling the arts, band, choir, etc.? CDC recommends these activities occur outside, but how will these be addressed in inclement weather or when fall and winter arrive? If that teacher has five classes a day with 30 students each and that teacher tests positive for COVID, do all 150 of those students, students need to then stay home in quarantine for 14 days? Do all 150 of those students now have to get tested before returning to school? Who pays for those tests? Are they happening at school? Does everyone in each of those children's families need to get tested? Who pays for that? If a student tests positive, will all the students in that child's class and their teachers need to quarantine for 14 days? Do they all need to be tested before they will be able to return to school? Who pays for those tests? Are they happening at the school? Does everyone in those affected families need tested? Kind of redundant. Has any consideration been given to having the teachers actually teaching their daily curriculums from the safety of their classrooms or homes where they have access to all the items they need to effectively do so and have students virtually participated in a full school day every day, five days a week, thereby keeping kids safe at home or in a smaller group environment deemed safe by their parents 
in keeping teachers safe in their own individual classrooms or homes isolated from students and other teachers. Why should we send our kids to school when for our own safety you moved this board meeting to a large space where social distancing could be observed with current capacity limits for such gatherings? Shouldn't our kids deserve the same courtesy? Kristen Carmick. I would like to know if there will be an option for 100% teacher-led remote learning offered with 40-minute class periods Monday through Friday. Primary focus would be on core curriculum and allow parents to take care of PE, STEM, music, and other ways during this unconventional school year. Is it possible to hire more teachers to teach those students who would choose a 100% remote learning? If not, is that decision being made due to finances only? I would suggest smaller Zoom class sizes to allow for more individualized learning as it was very hard for children to feel comfortable to ask questions or actively participate on the Zooms that were set up during the crisis learning that ended the 2019-2020 school year. I do feel that we are, all did our very best with the options we had. We need many improvements in order to make this successful going forward. Thank you. Leslie Simic. Hello, thank you for reviewing my questions. I know returning to school safely is not going to be an easy decision. What is the plan beyond reopening? How will we know we are doing well? What happens if we are wrong? If my child is attending in person and gets COVID beyond the 14 day quarantine, what else is required to return to school? Would my in-person attending child have access to remote learning if they were home on 14 day quarantine? If in person, Will students with the same last name be attending on the same day across all the grades? With a nationwide shortage, how does the school intend to have enough PPE plus products on hand at any given time? Will the schools be using products off of US EPA's List N, disinfectants for use against SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19? Thank you. Michelle McLennan. I'm inquiring about what consideration is being given to students with 504 plans for the upcoming school year, if there is any remote learning, and who parents should contact for student-specific information. Thanks. Emily Molidor and Jessica Peterson. This is Emily Molidor and Jessica Peterson from the American Heart Association. We are writing to thank and recognize your school district and your support for the American Heart Association through the Kids Heart Challenge, American Heart Challenge, and the District Heart Challenge programs this year. This program is designed to teach students in a memorable and fun way how to stay heart healthy, not only physically, but mentally too. Thanks to Dr. Sparlin's incredible support each year, we are able to incorporate these programs in all of the schools. This year, even through the pandemic, your district held 19 programs. I would like to take a moment to recognize the following staff for the efforts. Erin Skaggs, Jen Waters, Jody Strumps, Strumpa, Mike Bach, Bruce Conrad, Sam Creek, Steve Tubman, Bob Consolin, Tim Karstensen, Aaron Dudley, Robin Ormsby, Sue Warren, Ryan Parr, Jess Jagger, Connor Berry, Kim Brown, Teresa Comitas, Darren Howard, Laura Nussel, and the rest of the PE staff within the district. All of these staff members do a tremendous job instilling heart healthy habits in their students with this program, not only physically, but mentally too. It's clear they are so passionate about the health and wellness of their students, and we love seeing this come to life each year at their schools. We cannot thank you enough. Not only do these staff members teach students to be healthy, but they reiterate the importance of helping others and offer an outlet for donations to the American Heart Association to go toward advancement in cardiovascular research, local hospitals to provide guidelines for the best care, advocacy efforts, and more. While donations are not required to participate in the program, this community raised a total of $70,544 to fight our nation's leading cause of death, heart disease. We are incredibly inspired and we are grateful for the work you do as staff, but also the support of the entire school communities. 
Now more than ever, education on staying heart healthy is so very important to keep hearts strong with COVID present. And these donor dollars have helped the AHA has been to fund research on COVID as it relates to heart disease. We know that heart disease affects so many, and while we know next year will look different, we continue to support your school with resources. Thank you, District 308, so very much for your support. We wish you the best this summer and in your planning for next school year. Thank you. Brian Pope. I'm not sure if I will be able to live stream or attend the meeting this evening, but I wanted to understand more context on whatever the district's plans are this fall. Given that children are statistically more likely to die in the car ride to school than from COVID, I want to understand more about what population of school employees are more susceptible, susceptible to the virus. Worldwide statistics also indicate children are more unlikely, if at all, to transmit the virus to adults. Thus, from my perspective, the main risk to opening schools is more staffing related than health. Hence, back to my original question. I hope I can join the webcast, but I look forward to hearing more regardless. Thanks. Alex Soloto. First off, thanks for all you do for the students, staff, and community. I recognize the impossible position we are all put in during this unprecedented time. The nation is under pressure to get children back into schools as soon as possible. We are told to open the schools or else. What I want to do is get some answers to some questions. Usually, I try not to get stuck in the weeds. However, when it is a matter of life and death for students and staff members, I believe a lot of questions need to be answered. I have highlighted only some of my many questions below. What are we doing for staff members who are medically fragile or have medically fragile family members in their homes? Are they able to teach online with a doctor's note? If a teacher is forced to quarantine but is healthy enough to work from home, can they do so? If a teacher is forced to quarantine, will they be forced to use sick days from their bank of days? Who will sub for these teachers knowing we have had sub shortages for years? How are we interpreting the language to the extent possible found in the guidelines without becoming unsafe? What considerations are being taken to ensure our youngest learners are following social distancing? As a former kindergarten teacher, I recognize the logistical impossibility of this. How will the district support the stress level mental well-being of teachers? We say that children need to interact with one another, but how much interaction can be done with masks from six feet apart? I have heard people say that children don't get or transmit the virus. Children have arguably been the most social distanced group of the population with schools and many daycares closed since March. We simply do not have the data. But what we have seen is summer camps and sports programs showing outbreaks of COVID in children in the recent weeks. Does the district feel we have sufficient data to support the safety of children in any face-to-face -face model? Instead of providing only questions, I also hope to be solution-based. I would like to offer the only solution that accounts for the number one most important thing here, the potential loss of human life. The solution is that we continue to teach and learn remotely. To me, this is the only solution that keeps our staff and students safe. I know that this is not ideal for so many reasons, but it is truly the only way. We can close academic achievement gaps once a vaccine is available, and we can return to a safer in-person learning environment, but we cannot recover a child, staff member, family member's life. If we make this decision swiftly, we can focus on building a robust remote learning program to support learners from the safety of their homes. I hope that the board will consider this option seriously. Thank you. Allison Abels. We cannot ensure the safety of staff and students while still receiving any of the benefits of face-to-face -face instruction. While maintaining six-foot distances, teachers cannot engage students in group work, approach a student to look at their work, walk around the room, lend pencils, or even safely take a drink of water. There are effective digital or remote equivalents for all of these, and we are fortunate to be in a district where we have the resources we need for remote learning. As a teacher who is at higher risk from COVID-19, I am frankly very worried about the safety of the students, teachers, and other staff members, and their families who are like me. We know it is unsafe for staff and students to return to school, and we know that some people will die as a result. 
It is my hope that the board does not intend to do so anyway. Melissa Hernandez. Hello, my question for the meeting would be, if parents are not comfortable sending kids at home, are we going to have an option of doing e-learning from home? Also, what about kids with disabilities that will have a hard time keeping a mask? Jen Kierberg. Has the district given consideration to a school day schedule that will not include eating lunch in the buildings? Surrounding districts will be following this format to prevent the need for students to remove masks when less than six feet from others. Melanie McAllister. Dear School Board 308, I really think in-person learning at school is not safe right now. I think the best thing for our community of parents, students, staff, and educators is remote learning. The teachers, staff, parents, and students need to stay safe. One or two semesters of remote learning is not the end of the world if it keeps our community safe. Right now, it's not even safe to have students screened to go into kindergarten. Right now, 40 principals at an in-person school board meeting about the back-to-school learning plan recently got infected with COVID-19. There were three teachers that were doing virtual summer school in one classroom with masks and gloves, and they all got infected with coronavirus, and one teacher died. Also, another thing that needs to be considered is that students with autism have difficulty wearing a mask all day. But even all students will have difficulty wearing a mask all day. My son with ADHD can wear a mask for about one hour to visit his grandparents outdoors, and then he can't handle it. And it has to be a mask without the elastic because the elastic rubbing on him bothers him. Plus, I think that if you do pursue in-person learning, then after two weeks, one person will get sick in the classroom, and then we are back to just doing remote learning the rest of the year. I also don't understand why it's okay for students to have lunch in their classroom without masks on. The coronavirus is airborne, and they said it's expelled in tiny droplets when you talk and eat, right? That just seems like a hotbed of germs spread around during their lunch period. And how would we handle special specials and recess and PE class? Two students died while running with masks on outside in PE class. Plus, how effective will teaching be if all day teachers have to say the following? Johnny, your mask is not a slingshot. Jane, you can't blow your nose in your mask. I am going to laugh, and I'm really sorry. Jim, don't chew on your mask. And no, you can't trade masks with someone else, or did you lose your mask again? And if any student has a slight cough or sniffle, do you have to rush them to the nurse's office? Anyway, I hope you found my opinion informative. Thanks. Jillian O'Connor. I am writing this email about returning to school year 2020-2021 as a concerned parent and a healthcare professional of almost 20 years. I do not agree with kids going back to school. I know many do not agree with this, but I feel the need to express my concern here. There is no vaccine, no cure, and since phase four of reopening, there has been an increase in the number of cases of COVID-19. Point proven, the more exposure, the higher the risk. There is no reason why we need to risk children being exposed to this awful virus. What happens during cold and flu season when children get sick? How do we know it is COVID-19 or the common cold? Are we going to put these children through the god-awful test for COVID-19 with every sniffle? Because let's face it, how many kids do you see at schools with runny nose, allergies, sneezing, and or coughing? Who's going to monitor mask wearing, social isolation, and hand washing? I do not understand this risk knowing that all it takes is one child to get COVID-19, and in my opinion, one kid is too many. I get it, these kids are missing out, but let me tell you as a pediatric nurse, ER, and ICU, how many children I have seen miss a year or two of school due to illness. They were fine. Kids are resilient, and quite honestly, if they are behind, well, guess what? All of them will, behind, will be behind together, and when we come back from all of this, they can catch up together. What about online education? Why can't teachers be online more than 30 minutes one or two times a week? Why can't we have virtual teachers as if they were in the classroom? I understand this is not the norm, but we need to adapt to the new norm. We are facing new challenges with COVID-19. Many have figured out ways to be innovative through these challenging times. So let's be innovative with education. Majority of us, if not all, within District 308 have access to technology. Why not continue online learning? I do not feel comfortable with my son returning to school. So what happens if my husband and I refuse to send him? 
honestly, what are the options being discussed for the school year? Every district seems to be doing different things, but what is frustrating for me is why we are pushing these kids to go back, risking exposure, lifelong complications, and possibly death. We are still learning every day about COVID-19, and the bottom line is that we still do not know enough to expose these children. Boyetford Bach. Safety of District 308's children, families, and staff should be at the forefront of any decision the district makes regarding reopening schools. As a high-risk individual with a second grader attending Homestead Elementary, I sincerely hope that a full remote stay-at-home option for my child will be available. The district will undoubtedly see transmission of COVID-19 through our schools shortly after they open, regardless of how careful they are with the safety policies, procedures, temperature checks, and other half measures. Children carrying the disease simply do not show symptoms nearly as much as adults. I understand this option may not work for all families, but having a robust and consistent remote learning policy for elementary age students will keep our students on track with their education while also keeping everyone healthy. The worst policy 308 can create is one that reopens the schools only to close them a few weeks later as students and staff start testing positive for the disease. If a full stay-at-home option is not available for high-risk families, we'll have to entertain the idea of pulling our children out of school in order to mitigate our risk. Thank you. Sally Wilson. Good evening, and thank you for your time. I want to share with you concerns of many community members and teachers alike that the technology provided for our teachers is no longer sufficient, nor is it adequate for our changing educational landscape. As you know, Oswego teachers are not currently provided with any form of technology that allows them to easily transition their professional responsibilities between school and home. This is despite the fact that we have, and continue to, increase the requests we make for teachers to work from home to meet the needs of our students. The Chromebooks issued by the district during remote learning to teachers lacking personal technology was not sufficient to complete the, ta complete the work being asked of them during this time. This included creating online video lectures, actively showing problem solving on a digital whiteboard, and switching between multiple screens simultaneously. I request that you use CARES Act funding to purchase PC laptops or upgraded Chromebooks. The most effective technology doubles as a tablet, using a stylus for ease of writing on screen and the proper graphic technology to effectively stream and record videos for all teachers. As in most of the surrounding districts, I maintain grades six through 12 as the highest priority. Secondly, I would like you to consider the current widespread use of Google Classroom. I am a high school teacher in a neighboring district. We utilize a Canvas learning platform, as do other surrounding districts, including Naperville 203. This platform fully integrates with Google Suite, but also provides teachers and students with features that far and away are superior to Google Classroom, which is nothing more than a place to organize links. Canvas provides teachers the ability to easily collaborate online, design, and give secure online assessments, which change each time a student takes it, sets benchmarks for students to achieve, and restrict them from moving forward until proficiency is reached. Easily record their voice reading ass assessment questions and much more. <clears throat> I realize that our community voted to not increase funding to the district, but with the new demands placed on our teachers to provide and interact in seamless in-person and remote learning experiences with our students, I ask that you look for funding. We need to provide our teachers with the tools they need to do the job we are asking of them and our students with learning opportunities that continue to demonstrate that we are an exemplary district. Thank you. Ashley Smith. Hello, my name is Ashley Smith. I am a new incoming sophomore here at Oswego East. I am speaking before the board to express my concern about my safety for returning to school in the fall. I want to make sure that safety and sanitation is considered in all decision-making processes. I have been informed of a product that will sanitize and disinfect surfaces. It is proven to kill COVID-19 in under 60 seconds and gives up to six weeks of protection after one application. This company also has other products to offer such as hand sanitizers that provide six hours of protection after one use and electrostatic sprayers. I would like the board to consider it as they determined how to keep the staff and students healthy and safe. The company is called Phi, company, or Phi Supply Company, and I have attached their materials for your review. I am looking forward to returning to school in the fall in a safe environment. Thank you for your time. Stephanie Crest. 
Hi, I would like to offer up an option that makes more sense than every other day. Every other day is a disaster for parents who need child care as well as for child care providers. It also does not allow enough time for droplets to settle between new groups of students, making for much more deep cleaning needed. Every other week makes much more sense. This allows the teachers to teach a group for a whole week, which allows for them to meet the class where they are, where they are at better. It also allows for the kids to have more time to absorb the current material. Every other week also means that the kids are at school for four to five days, depending on how long of a week they go, and then home for nine to ten days. This gives longer for symptoms to appear, which will lead to less exposure if someone has COVID. It could also mean less students needing to self-quarantine as kids on the days that were not at school that week would not be exposed like they would if they went every other day. The exposure would then be coming from the teacher who would be most likely be able to quarantine like the exposed class. It wouldn't be coming from contaminated surfaces. Every other week also helps parents and child care providers plan better. Full week child care is cheaper than part-time child care as well. Overall, every other week makes more sense than every other day. First name only with the next one, Mark. Members of the board, teachers, and parents. These challenging times have changed how we conduct every aspect of our lives. This also includes how we educate our children of the future. When the pandemic hit back in March and we moved to shelter in place, this also included schools. I want to applaud the board and teachers for quickly moving to a virtual format. Well done. We were able to complete the school year. We have learned more about the virus as time passes on. Experts weigh in, including Academy of Pediatricians, stating the importance of schooling and children. Recommendation to go back to a live format to provide better teacher-student interaction, socialization with friends, and normalcy. I support a live school engagement with safety precautions in place. Thank you for considering. First name only, David. I know we are considering A and B schedules for high school. Why not block scheduling? Where the kids can go back five days a week. Most of these older kids are already back at work or hanging out with their friends all day long anyway. How does it make sense that you can work at McDonald's or Target every day and be around hundreds of people but you can't go to school? Either or, two days a week or five days a week, everyone is still going to be exposing themselves. Keep them in school and they have less a chance of getting exposed. Annie Hardigan. As a staff member and a parent in District 308, I implore you to please be careful in what you are promising to parents and staff. Children are traumatized and struggling through this pandemic. The image of school in this age will not help quell their fears. Please keep in mind the immense tasks you are asking our administration and teachers to complete with no training or funding. Thank you for all of your efforts and consideration in these matters. Item 6.1, board member comments. Who would like to begin? I will happily begin. First, I just wanted to say thank you to all of our administrators from the building level and um, at the district administrative level. I know how hard you guys have been working, and I'm sure you're very anxious to get to the point in this meeting where you can present your plan and answer many, if not all, of the questions that were asked tonight. Um, I just want to say if anything has shown how little we are in control of our lives on this planet, it has been this pandemic situation. And one of the few things that we are able to control though is our own attitude and the words that come out of our mouth. And I think it's so important for us to convey to our children and to be an example to them and have a positive attitude. None of this is what anybody wants or expected or anticipated. And I think that it's our jobs as parents to help our kids through that. One of the last comments was how children are traumatized. Part of the reason I feel like they're traumatized is because of our adult reactions. And it's very important for us to model a positive attitude. Instead of, woe is me and everything's horrible and I can't believe this is happening, how about Let's get excited. Some things are going to change, and maybe it'll be great. We don't know. Um, but 
I think our attitude going into it is critical to what we're going to get out of it. And so I hope that I can show that to all of you and, of course, to my own children, and that we will consider that um, as community members and our interactions with each other and just in our own family and communicating to our teachers. And I think it's an opportunity for something great to happen. We don't know. Maybe it'll be the best thing. And along those lines, I think we're going to try as a district to do new plans, new ideas that um, I know Faith and her team have really come up with some out of the box kind of cool stuff. Um, but we're going to fail. Some of these things aren't going to work. And you need to know that going in. But at the end of the day, it's your choice as a parent how you proceed with your kids. So I just want to say... Um, I'm a board member, and I'm a teacher in another district, and I'm a parent. And when I look at this whole situation, I see the pressure from every side. So I see that you have parents that are pressured to go to work. They have to show up. They have to do their job. There's no choices. They have to have money. We can't judge the people who have to go out to work. They need the money. The district is pressured to reinstate school face-to-face -face by some of these parents that you've heard in comments. And we have to take those considerations um, to heart, as well as the, the recommendations of parents who say, this is not safe, we should not go back to school. And then the parents have a pressure to answer the survey for their own children and for their own situation and say, this is what I want to see happen in August. I either want to see face-to-face -face or online or some other combination. And the school board has to figure out what the safest option is going to be overall. And I was just looking online. Sorry, Gloria, for the pop-up that started making noise. But there are some districts that have decided to do only online in August. And they're saying that we live in the age of technology, safety is available, and that's what we're choosing. Two of them are San Diego and Los Angeles. And I was part of Los Angeles Unified for 13 years. And I think that that's something that we should all think about, no matter what your opinion is. It's a big decision that we have to make about how we put kids back into schools. It's a big responsibility to make sure that the adults and the kids and all the people, the cafeteria, the custodians, the secretaries are safe so that they can live, not so that they can have social time or some of the things. You have to rank the, the needs that we're looking at here. So I just want to say that education may have to change for a while, and it may have to get to a, a place where if it is in person, it's going to be less rambunctious. It will be more separated. Nobody will share a pencil or work in a group. And we're going to have to try a lot of things to make it go. But I think that we can, can come to a reasonable conclusion for the school year. But people have to stay reasonable. People have to understand that they need to be flexible. They need to look at it from other people's perspectives. And that's a mature thing to do. So no matter what you believe, which way, you have to consider other people's ideas. And that's pretty much what I keep doing in my head when we're reading these letters and hearing these things from everybody in the community. I keep trying to see it from that perspective. So, Allie, I, th I think you kind of really hit it on the the nail on the head a little bit as 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 positive and I think as um, as good the plan is moving forward it's a new plan it's it's something that we're trying for the first time and there probably will be hiccups um, so some things probably will fail but going into it we're going to be able to um, hopefully have enough options that's going to provide enough safety, security, and confidence in families that are choosing uh, the, the path that they want to go down. And as you say, Tony, there are certain communities out there that are doing something completely different than what we're doing. And that's something that is, is really um, important as our board because we're here as a reflection of our community, what's happening around us, what's going on in Kendall County, what's going on in Chicago, what's going on in Illinois, and it's a little bit different than what is going on in L.A. or 
Texas or, or Florida right now. Um, so we can go through this process looking at our needs and doing what's best for the families here in this district. So I think it's a great opportunity. It's a, it's a, a typically burdensome responsibility for, for this board to go through and decisions that we're making, uh, but I'm confident that all of us up here are uh, capable to do uh, what is necessary and able to make the best decision moving forward. So I'm looking forward to what the team has to present tonight, and um, that way we can give our community some guidance and what the options are going to look like moving forward. Um, you know, I'll just say, I want to say to, to the parents out there who are, um, are eagerly awaiting this presentation, who are anxiously um, anticipating what they'll hear tonight, who are thinking ahead, who are worried about their kids, who have a lot of different questions and concerns. Um, you know, I, I see you and I hear you and I'm looking forward to the presentation tonight. I think it's gonna answer a lot of our questions. It's not gonna answer all the questions. It's just not. There's, it's nine o'clock at night on a Monday. We're in early stages still, even though I'm sure our administration team feels like um, they've been working on this for an eternity. Um, so we're gonna hear the presentation. We're gonna have a lot of questions. We're gonna be able to answer questions. There's gonna be a lot more questions that come up. And I just want to ask everybody for some patience as we work through the very real concerns and questions that will still remain once we hear about um, what the upcoming school year may look like for all of us. But um, I appreciate everybody's feedback and their passionate, um, passionate care, you know, about what this, what, what, what the school year will look like for their kids. Um, so hopefully we're gonna get there soon. You know, I was just gonna say, uh, I had a, a fascinating and enlightening, enlightening discussion with the, a, a parent of, of the district after our last school board meeting in the parking lot as I was walking out and he was sharing some information about um, the health issues that one of his children is facing. And I asked a question um, about, well, what, what, is, what are your doctors telling you? What are, what are they telling you is best? And, and I think he, he summed all of it up when he said, they don't have any idea. Um, and so I'm not trying not to steal thunder here, but you know we're we're about to see a presentation that allows for options, which is what um, is I think that's a great thing that we're doing and every district is doing. We're providing options to allow us to continue to educate those that are most vulnerable. Um, but also trying to get some normalcy back into the classroom. I, you know, I, I don't think, I, well, I think we've learned how children do and do not respond to online learning. And, and there is something missing um, by being in front of a computer. And so I'm, I'm glad we're moving in the right direction. And quite frankly, um, I, I am an optimist. And so I, I'd like, I'm hoping that, you know, a month or two from now, and by the way, I looked this morning, and right now the confirmed infection rate is coming in at, at around 2 or 3% in the state of Illinois in our region. That's a great thing. If that continues, right, we're testing more, but the positivity rate is not increasing. Um, you know, we may get to the point where it's not an issue, and we're moving out of stage 4 and into stage 5. Then we can reassess what we're doing, and so that's I, I, I echo the initial uh, comments here quickly. And, and Faith and your staff and all the administrators in the district, we appreciate and we can't thank you enough for all the work that you guys are doing. And unfortunately, it's not going to stop <laughs> because things are going to change. Let's hope they change for the better, and that in a few months we're having a conversation about 
returning to a regular schedule. I'm going to echo what my fellow board members have all shared with is mostly our gratitude to our administration. This is something that has never been done. This is something that in our district we're doing with limited resources. And um, it has been handled very gracefully and with huge amounts of compassion for the needs of our families and students. And thank you very much, everyone who's been working on that for providing that for our families and for our community. Um, we know that it doesn't have to be that way, but we, we really appreciate it. And I, I think I can pretty safely say that for most of our community, so thank you. Um, I think that I'm just gonna go ahead and let us go on to the superintendent's report. Um, I do wanna just clarify one thing, which is that we do follow. In, in our presentation, we will have some limited abilities to discuss and adapt, but we are following Illinois Department of Public Health guidelines, Illinois State Board of Education guidelines for reopening of schools. And as such, our decision-making capability as a board, and, and for the most part as an administration, will be limited um, as we follow uh, what they have decided is the best practices. So thank you, item 6.2. All right, well thank you, Mrs. Doyle, and I share your optimism, Brent. Appreciate that. So happy, happy new school year to everyone. It's, it's July, you know. Uh, summertime at the district office is always a very, very busy time. And But I can tell you, this summer has been the busiest in my 29 years in education. Um, I'd like to thank all the district, all the uh, administrators at the district level for the uh, long hours. I think I've had this mask on for 12 hours today now. And uh, the long hours, the high stress levels that uh, everyone's working under as we... Uh, work on creating and navigating the plan that we're about to present to you. As you can imagine, this is no easy task, and uh, each day we come together as a leadership team. We spend two to three hours a day as, as a team to go over the tasks for the day and to ensure that the work is getting done in a very systematic way. And uh, as Mrs. Croner just said, um, we look forward to presenting the work tonight. So I believe uh, this presentation this evening will answer a lot of questions people pose tonight, the questions that you and Mr. Bauman read. I think a lot of those questions will be answered. And uh, as someone else stated, I think Heather stated, there will be there will be more questions from the presentation. And over the next couple of weeks, we will be ramping up the communication to parents as we roll out this plan. And uh, I'm very excited to uh, get to the presentation. So I'll leave my, the rest of my comments for the information. Thank you. Item seven, approval of the consent agenda. Can I have a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve all items under consent, including 7.1 minutes from the June 8th, 2020 virtual Board of Education meeting, open and closed session, and from the June 27th, 2020 special Board of Education meeting, open and closed session. 7.2, to acknowledge the FOIA requests received by the district. Second. Mrs. Croner. Aye. Mr. Lightfoot. Aye. Mrs. Moyer. Aye. Mr. Bauman. Aye. Mrs. Swanson. Aye. Mrs. Doyle. Aye. Ms. Morgan. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Item 8.1 is financial statements. Does the board have any questions on this evening's financial statements? I did have a couple. I'll try and keep it as brief as possible because um, I saw some pretty big negative percentages and I'm just wondering what those were from. So if you look under the expenses section. Um, so, so this is our new software that we just put in um, remaining budget into our expense side and nothing was put in for salaries and benefits as far as the budget in the software. Not, not the total amount that was remaining. So that's why you see those negatives in those two areas. Okay. But now that we'll have a, we're starting a new fiscal year, so you'll have good numbers a going cleaner forward. Num okay. Great. When the budget's adopted, yes. Yeah. Well, along those same lines, I was kind of curious about in the income section, it looks like we're saying we're still missing half of our pro property okay. taxes for the year. So. On the income side, we put in the entire budget, but not a whole year's of revenue received. And yes, we haven't, uh, I'm not sure that um, the payments that were 
received late in June have been recorded in the general ledger yet. So that's probably why, as far as property taxes. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm sorry, can I clarify? So what you're seeing in those property taxes are just what was recorded in the new software, not what was recorded in the old software. So it really is only a half year of receipts. Will we be able to, can we please see then the numbers for the other half of the year from the old software as well? You will. Uh, the audit will definitely reflect both sides, but we'll try uh, to. If we, yeah, to, if we could see those. To get the December like. statement, because that would get that, and then the. I was, was going to say, even if it's just a spreadsheet where you yep. put two numbers together, I, yep. I think we're just trying to get a sense of. Where we are with the where, where are we ending this year? Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can do that. Thank you. Item 8.2 is an intergovernmental intergovernment agreement with PASIC. Uh, Dr. Hildebrand is here to answer any questions the board may have regarding this agreement. So I'd ask the board, are there any questions regarding item 8.2? I had emailed a question that she was able to answer for me, and I, I would guess that if I had those questions, that probably some members of the public would have them as well. Do you want to give the answers that you gave me? Thanks. Sure. So thank you for your Very good. Any other questions for item 8.2? All right. Thank you, Dr. Hildebrand. All right. Item 8.3, 2021 school year update. So tonight we're going to provide the board with an informational report that will highlight the work that's been done regarding plans for the fall, who was involved in those plans, and what those plans look like. Tonight uh, is meant as a high-level overview of what will come next. There will be many questions, as I stated earlier, and uh, on the specifics of the plan and that we'll share tonight. And I can assure you that those questions will be answered uh, when the plan is ready to be rolled out. So with that, Faith, are you ready? Yes, it's my slide deck is up, Mike. All right, very good. We're attempting to make some changes to the camera so that we can be live streaming the presentation instead of just the boardroom as we would typically do so that we can have the most information available to as many people as possible. And the presentation is loaded in the board deck so they can see it as well. While we're waiting for the slide deck uh, to load, I just did want to say that this is my 23rd year as a school administrator and I'm about to give the most difficult presentation of my career. Um, it's not difficult because of the enormity of the change. I've handled problem solving before and head teams and all of those things. It's not the enormity of the task. But it is because our community and our state and our nation are conflicted over what to do about the health for our students. Not only the physical health for our students, but the mental health for our students and the academic health for students. And a lot of the priorities that are so near and dear to our heart are in conflict with one another. So as we go through the presentation, and these are the four parts, have patience because we are going to be wrestling with ourselves 
and with the community about providing the best options for our students. So tonight I will be reviewing the priorities for the fall, the timeline that was used in the process, then a large bulk of the presentation will be the description of the learning options that will be available. I know that that will set off a list of questions as well, and we'll have a process to answer individual student and staff questions as we go forward. We'll also talk about the timeline and the process that our families and our parents will use to make a choice about the fall. So some of the priorities as we wrestled with how to build this were how do we, of course, minimize the health risks, not only for our students, but for our staff as well. How do we maximize that time for in-person instruction? Lastly, how do we make sure that families have a choice? That they, as they wrestle with the very things that we're wrestling with, that they have a choice in how to meet the educational, emotional, social needs for their students and their families. For me and the team, trying to figure out the right balance between the two items on this scale were the hardest. Social distancing as much as possible, that's what we're supposed to do. But we need to maximize in-person instruction and often those two ideas are in conflict with one another. So very quickly, when we looked at the timeline, and June 23rd is when the, all the state guidelines came out. 10 working days away, by the way. <laughs> um, so by June 23rd, they put this out, and very quickly we said, we have to find out what our community wants. And we put together a survey. Then, after we knew what the mask requirements would be, what that would look like, to begin to find out, if I go back to the first slide here, what is that balance in our community? So we then surveyed staff, we surveyed parents, went through, talked about that, made a survey from June 27th to July 2nd, and then here are the results. So in the very far left column, you have the number of surveys returned from early childhood, elementary, junior high, and high school. Then. The items in pink are those parents that said that they want one of those in-person options. The options that were at early childhood were the number of wanting all kids every day with maximizing in-person instruction, knowing that with that social distancing isn't possible as much. Or do we want alternating days maximizing social distancing, but again back to that scale, going down on the amount of in-person instruction. We had 57% of the parents that wanted an in-person option go with the all kids every day. If you go further down, we asked the same question for elementary and what that looked like between alternating days. We had 66% that said we need kids all day, every day. Junior high, we explained uh, an option where we have students in, but for a shortened time and eliminating some of PE and what does that look like? Or would you want the full schedule and do every other day to have lower class size? 65% said that they would like the all day, every day. Our high schools are huge. <laughs> we could not think about having 2,800 students come in. So we really talked about, would you want a remote learning option or not? Now that far right column, we're not taking that as, here's the percent that will want remote learning. We believe that after they hear more about the details and know what remote learning is like, or they know more about what the in-person option will look like, that that percentage will change. But we wanted to ask the question. All right, so here we go. Let's talk about the two options. So the very first one, in-person instruction. Everyone does need to know that when we're talking about this, it could change. If numbers surge in Illinois, we could be right back to, this is not a guarantee that we will be in in-person instruction all year. We would have to follow guidelines. I also want to be very upfront. If we have a lot of staff that are sick or that go into having to quarantine or isolation, we may have to shut down a school or a bigger area because we do not have staff to do this option. So as I explain this option, this is pending current situations, pending health records. 
When we talk about remote learning, this is remote learning. I like to call it 2.0, the better model. Uh, we learned a few things from the spring. We've also been given um, more freedom to do what we would like to do with remote learning than what the state was able to provide back in April. So when I talk about that option, it will look very different. I almost wanted to call it something else, <laughs> but this is remote learning 2.0. All right, I'm first gonna talk about in-person instruction. So at early childhood, we would bring in students five days a week for some of the small group time. If you can imagine students here in front of me at circle time, we might do that twice instead of once, being able to do more social distancing. We obviously sand and water tables and let's all play together, has to work differently, but that would be in-person five days a week. Elementary. We're also, based on that community feedback, saying five days a week. It would be a shortened uh, day by about an hour, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. The way that we're doing that is we are uh, pulling back some of the time that we are in PE and the number of times that we would go for that and for art and for music. Uh, and then we also needed to shorten our day just a little bit to provide a lot more supervision time for our staff, because you imagine getting 400 students in the building is going to take a lot longer socially distanced to do that. Junior high, pay attention for this one because this is the hardest one to explain. So right now in junior high, we have nine periods. We wanted to get down to six. So we said PE is problematic. We can't have them change, we can't have them lockers. Let's figure out how to do remote learning PE. Okay, now we're down to eight. We said lunch. Uh, can we figure out and take that period out? Okay, now we're down. Then if you look at our language arts pieces, we currently have two blocks and we're wanting to take that down to one and have the other half of ELA be remote learning where they do their independent reading and writing and be sent to be home. So now we're down to that magic number of six, which we could have then three periods, one day, three periods the next day and do it for block. That means at junior high, they have entry, they have one transition period, they have another transition, and then they're out. That's the way that uh, remote, that, that's the way in-person instruction will work at junior high. High school, kind of easy. You think about it, you divide the school by half. It would be by the alphabet. It actually breaks a little differently right now between OH and OE, so I'm what that exact letter line would be. But you break it in half, Half the students come Tuesday, Thursday. The other half comes Wednesday, Friday. Monday is the makeup day so that we make sure that we have the same number of instructional days for group A and group B. All right. Next slide's easier. These are the times. Early childhood would be decreased by 15 minutes. Elementary would be a shorter day. 9, 10 to 3, 10, then junior high. Much shortened day without lunch. High school is a regular start and end time, but students would only come two to three days a week. Lots of discussion about face coverings. We will be following what the state has said we should be doing for face coverings. This means that all students and staff and for students, there are slight pieces of whether they have a medical certified exemption that we would go through and look at that. Then we would be suggesting face shields, suggesting other times maybe they can wear it for most of the day, but not all of the day. We need to have everyone in face coverings. And that means from the moment that they come in onto the bus, as soon as they are around other people, it means the staff in meetings. When I sit with my staff, we all have to be in face coverings. The only times that we cannot uh, make that happen or that we can take a break is when we go outside and we are more than six feet apart from each other during lunch. Or if we can go outside for an activity where we can all be six feet apart. And other than that, we all have to be in face coverings. Lots of people asking me about lunch uh, at elementary. We're gonna have multiple spaces that would be designated for this. 
some of that time that I said we were taking away from music and art will make some of those larger rooms available where we can spread out and do the lunch pieces. Obviously, we'll have to have lots of cleaning that happens between the time that students would come in and rotate what they would be doing junior high or going to have grab and go lunches that they can take. If students need a lunch, they'll take it on their way out of the school day. And then high school, each school has many lunch spaces. We've gone through the seven different lunch periods, where they would go, how it would be cleaned. That also will be a much reduced uh, grab and go type of pieces or s limited options to make that time really about getting the eating done and not all the wide selection of food. Uh, lots of questions about buses. The state guidelines have said that we can have 50 students, 50 people on a bus, that's 49 students and a driver. So we can have 50 people on a bus. They have to wear their face coverings. What we will do is we'll assign seats because we want to keep track of who is sitting where so we know who is close in proximity. We want siblings to share seats. This does mean, if you think about the size of our buses, that you would be able to have two students share a seat. Now, not all our buses are to capacity, and we will certainly try to you know, limit what that would be, but we want to be really upfront with the in-person options that this is what it looks like to come to school on a bus. Clubs and activities at the K-8 level, we do not anticipate at this time running clubs and activities. There's so many interactions when you think about the bubble that we're trying to make around our elementary classes and then to open a school-wide activity after school and spread all of that. While I love clubs and activities, I just don't think that that, as we considered all of this, was the place to go. We do want to look at see if we can do some online clubs and activities at a later date. High school activities, some of those may run. Now, if you think about athletics and clubs and activities, there's a problem with our A schedule and our B schedule. So we are going to run a bus around to those students that indicate that they need a bus back to school on the days that they are off-site to be able to come back and participate because we wanted to be equitable and fair with all of that. Parking passes, <laughs> really important, especially to our high school students, but we have thought about that. Uh, and this actually will allow a lot more people to have parking passes because there'll only be A and B day. Uh, and then you know, we've figured out what that would be and we'll be communicating all of that as such. We won't have parking spaces that are sitting there unavailable every other day. Symptoms. And here's where some of the continued fun is. We anticipate new guidelines. We anticipate new things. Um, right now, we know that we need to have our students and our parents daily report symptoms to us. We need to know if they have a cough that isn't related to something else. There's a whole list, but the list is possibly changing here in a little bit, so we're not putting this in concrete terms right now. We just want to know that Anybody who chooses an in-person option, you're going to need to say, okay, how are you feeling today? What, you know, what does this look like? Do you have a temperature? You should not be coming to school. And there will probably be some daily piece that parents will need to report that their child is healthy and coming to school. We also will need to know if there's been any positive COVID-19 tests, and there'll be a format for doing that. Lots and lots of questions have hit my inbox, um, <laughs> probably even more so other people, about how are we going to keep track of all that, who needs to be quarantined, all of that. Those are also guidelines that we think are about to do some changing. So while those of you viewing at home may be like, well, this was great, but I need a lot more information on that, we believe that some of it may be changing, so we will be providing that soon, but we wanted to know some more concrete details before we did that. All right, visitors, non-essential visitors, and unfortunately that means parents as well, uh, and guests will not be allowed past the front office.
hallways and social distancing. We are going to have some hallways and staircases that are only one way traffic. Other hallways, if you think about it, if you put a line down the middle, this side has to be going this way, and this way has to be just like roads, rules of the road. But we don't, we haven't always done that with hallways. Now we need to. Hand sanitizer, we've gone through and looked at different um, hand sanitizer options, and there'll be a big gallon pump of hand sanitizer in every single classroom so that students and staff had that whenever they need it. We also are going to have hand sanitizer dispensers permanently mounted at different places in the building so that it's accessible, especially at the front office, the nurse station, around the cafeteria, uh, commonly used places such as that. Cleaning and sanitation. <laughs> Our maintenance department is really spending a lot of time thinking about what they will be able to do. We've, eh, and I heard another email as we, as you talked about it today, you know, we have electrostatic sanitizing sprayers that have been purchased to be able to use at the end of the day uh, to help with all of the really intense cleaning that needs to happen in the sanitation. Bathrooms, we're going to have to be very specific, and I wish I could tell you at every bathroom, but every bathroom and every hallway is going to be a little different on what it looks like to be used. We do envision for some of our bathrooms, even lines out in the hallway, that you have the six foot markers and you have to wait your turn to go into the bathroom. And then we also will have to do a lot of cleaning and more thorough cleaning in the bathrooms. In-person instruction will not include field trips this year. We will not be taking trips outside of the district or inside the district. Special education, especially for the in-person options, we will still be pulling out students, uh, providing those services uh, at the junior high level. When you think about the shortened day, we may be able to provide some of those services even outside of the regular school day through teletherapy and other pieces like that. And then if you think our high school where it's alternating, we will be able to sometimes use the off day to do some of those uh, services through telephone or digital, or we'll group those students and be able to push into the classes or pull out to provide those treatments and the things that our students need. Also, for anybody that is in a self-contained special education program, uh, think EVA, think those types of pieces. We are not alternating days for them. They would continue to come to school every day. Also, our English learners, especially at the high school level that are newcomers, they would come to school every single day. I think I need to go into show choir if we're <laughs> I'm projecting with a mask <laughs> and talking. I'm not as nervous as my voice sounds. I'm uh, working on uh, air control. I, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, English learner services for in person. This is pretty easy that we will do this as we typically have done and provide it for the classroom teachers and the team of teachers that would provide those services. Lockers aren't an issue at early child and elementary, but at junior high and high school, we are seeing no use of student lockers. So they would need to carry their materials that they need in their backpack throughout the day. PE lockers cannot be used by guidelines and we will look at some of the athletic lockers that might be a possibility, but for the most part, there's no locker use. That will help with the hallways, that will help with congregation, uh, all of those things. PE, as long as the weather is good, this is somewhat easy to solve. We need to go outside, we need to be outside exercising. Early childhood and elementary will do this. Uh, of course, on the days that it is raining, or if we actually get to November, uh, we will need to be looking at what that looks like for smaller than 50 students to be involved. But also think we're going to be utilizing some of our lunchrooms and gymnasiums as the exact same space. So we're going to have to get creative with some of the PE. When you think about what you're <laughs> talking about, creative problem solving, as we march closer to colder and colder weather, we may need to rethink 
PE at the elementary level and what that looks like. At junior high, we're going to be doing that remote by posting videos, exercise plans, having people check in. We're expecting our junior high students to exercise outside of the regular school day. And then at high school, they will have their PE time, but they aren't dressing for PE. So even that PE class may have to be dramatically different as you think about people participating in their street clothes. Social distancing in classrooms at the early childhood level, we are going to want desks, tables, so that children are facing in the same direction. We've already put out the notice to staff that they need to be clearing out a lot of their extra furniture, uh, especially some of those really great, cute things in elementary classrooms are going to have to go because we need the space to be able to spread students out. At junior high, same type of thing. Desks will be facing in the same direction. We'll try as much as possible to be six feet apart. But in our junior high and our elementary classrooms, depending on how many students choose the other option of remote learning, six foot distancing is not always going to be possible. And we need to be upfront with that as people make these choices. Okay. Remote learning. Remote learning 2.0, let me first start here. How is it different than it was last spring? Last spring, you know, we talked about and there were state guidelines of even an hour to an hour and a half for second grade. And, you know, what does that look like? Um, now this is four to five hours of learning activities and instruction for students. And that's from first grade all the way through high school. So there's a lot more robustness, if you will, to what remote learning uh, would look like with this particular option. Grades and assessments, before there was the state piece of your grades can only get better, uh, that, that is not how we would start or continue the school year. There would be assessments, there would be grades, just like in a regular class, which is very different than how remote learning was before. Uh, and then attendance is going to be taken every day and students would need to answer a question or interact with their teacher and it would be taken every class and course at the junior high and high school level. So what does remote learning look like for a typical day? Do you want to be up front? Kindergarten is only going to be built as a half day remote. We are not going to try to have half day kindergarten and full day remote instruction. So if you choose remote instruction, it would be at the kindergarten level, a half day program. Then for the rest of the elementaries, uh, this would be led by district teachers. And we're hoping to utilize staff that have their own medical reasons of why they can't be at school uh, and use them to teach some of these pieces. We would have reading, writing, math, science, social studies, and our specialist teachers are also going to provide instruction and videos uh, for music, art, and PE. At the junior high and at the high school, we're going to use Edgenuity. And Edgenuity are pre-made courses with videos and instruction and assessment that some of our students have already used in the district. And there are pages and pages of courses to be able to choose from. And at the junior high, we want everybody to at least get their math science, um, social studies, and their ELA. And then at seventh and eighth grade, we would also have the Spanish electives. PE would be remote for this group as well. PE is remote even in, in person. High school, there would be minimum of six courses that all students would need to register for. Maximum of seven, unless you go over the higher fee. And then we will be publishing this when we talk about it with parents. But there are lots and lots of electives and different options and AP classes, different levels of, of math, different levels of ELA. And people, of course, will want to look at the courses that are available to know if this is the right option for them. Special education for all of the services and 
this would reply to the 504 students as well too, that we would you know, work within their remote learning plan or their 504 plan, looking at you know, what they are eligible for and then building those services as we can for remote learning. That includes Google Hangouts Meet, even could be assistance from their one-on-one -on -one teaching assistant uh, through Google Hangouts and what that looks like. Uh, and then just wanted to clarify, we had some people that were asking, will therapists be coming to our home? We will not be doing in-home therapy uh, during this time. Timeline. So today is the 13th. We want to gather, finalize, and then send communication and the selection or the choice form to parents on Wednesday. And then we will have, we've already got it built, um, a Google form that people can submit their questions or a phone number that they can call and we will record the questions and then a system to divvy out those questions to the right person. For instance, if everyone sends Dr. Sparlin all of the <laughs> questions or me all of the questions, we're just going to be divvying them out. So we're creating one place where everybody can send their questions, whether they're through a phone call, and then we'll get them routed to the right person and be able to respond quickly. Because by July 22nd, we would like all of our families to make a decision. And I know that may sound soon, but if you think about the amount of planning that needs to happen once we have that answer, from bus routes, from classes, from who's going to be able to teach remotely, um, what kind of textbooks, materials, all those things that needed to be ordered and needed to be in the right place. We need all the time that we can. So I know that that's a quick turnaround, one week, but I believe that we have a whole team of people that are going to answer those questions. Uh, and there will still be unanswered questions, I know when that deadline comes, because we can't predict the future. But that July 22nd, four o'clock deadline, we really need to stick to. And then we will be sending constant reminders to parents, like we need to hear from you. But if we do not hear from them, we're going to assume that they're going the in-person route and build accordingly. One of the things that we'll stress over and over is the choice by the parents needs to be made for a grading period at a time. You can't be, I'm in for remote learning, I'm out for remote learning, I'm in for, can't do that. We need to stay for elementary all the way through first trimester, for junior high and high school all the way through a semester at a time. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm sure I've answered everything. <laughs> <laughs> I already have a list of stuff that I, just I've thought about today. So I'm, I'm anticipating lots and lots of questions. I'm anticipating I'll have some answers. I'll anticipate some that we're working on that. I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to start by saying thank you. <laughs> this is, this is yeah, astounding. Can you tell me how many people were involved in this plan <laughs> that we had available? Uh, we had lots of uh, administrators. We also had a team from... The OA, and I really want to give a shout out to Elizabeth and Andrew. Um, they've been on the phone, you know, with us on the weekends, on uh, evenings, um, all the time, trying to figure out what is the best thing to do for students, but staff as well. Um, we've had to do a lot of these meetings remotely, uh, and we've had just the initial beginnings of a, a group of teachers that are giving me, you know, feedback on all of this, and then. The other work that isn't part of this presentation is we've done a lot of work on what if we go remote learning for all mm -hmm. and have to shut down. And that work we could start as soon as school got out. because we. But these plans really needed to wait until we knew what the state guidelines were going to be so that we could go back to that scale option. So hundreds <laughs> of people have probably worked uh, on this and hundreds more will need to work as we build and finalize even more. Thank you. That, it's, it's, that's an amazing amount of mm -hmm. options. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. Thank you. We felt that was important because every family's needs are different and there's mm -hmm. no clear cut. This is exactly what we all should be doing. I appreciate that. Hey, I have a 
few comments, maybe a couple questions. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, I think what's important to remember when these kids, no matter what they do, is that their grades count. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think that what we will see in engagement will change because grades count. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I think that no matter which route you choose, you have to make sure that you and your child know that this is your grade and it counts mm -hmm. until the governor decides otherwise. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think I think that's gonna be a huge, huge piece to some of this. I would maybe think about, and I don't know if this is set in stone, I would maybe think about busing the kids, splitting by neighborhoods and not necessarily by alphabet. And it, like, I mean, there's arguments to be made on both sides but kids and communities kind of hang out together. I think you're getting your kids and families that way. Uh, not to say that your way right. is any different, but I also think we could save on busing if we're doing, I, we could. I, again, I don't know the semantics of it, but I would just like to look into it, maybe. For the high school piece. Because everybody else is coming at the same, you know, all kids, same yeah. time, so for high school, right? Yeah, the high school is the only one that's divided by Alphabetically, right? Correct. That's the only time where you've got half of the oh, students okay. coming in at a time. Okay. Right. Then, yeah, I mean, I just wonder if it would save on busing. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't and it's a moot point, then just throw it out. Um, but uh, another question that may be for the board attorney more than, than I have, and I have kind of asked Maureen this before, is um, I have had people approach me with liability questions. And I think that's a huge concern, not only for us teachers in other districts and teachers in this district, but even as a board, mm -hmm. even as a, you know, a district itself and an entity. And I don't know if there's like a state. There is not. Um, <laughs> there have, you're not the first to ask, can we get any assurance of uh, protection against liability, whichever direction we go, and, and there's not. Um, I think the tremendous job of trying to do what you can, honoring the interests, but also following all the guidance of the health. Uh, uh, um, Department uh, of Health. Thank you. <laughs> Our, you know, and the CDC and the AAP, and the, you know, and, and they're constantly changing what they're saying. Um, and we hear there's going to be more guidance from them coming out. So, um, it, there is in Illinois a law was just recently passed that did say for workers' comp purposes there is a rebuttable presumption that if an employee gets it uh, while working, they got it while working, or, or if if they get it, the presumption is they got it while working. Um, so so it's already a risk for workers' comp. Okay, and then. The teacher safety part, I, I had in my notes, especially those immunocompromised, I think you already touched on mm -hmm. a little bit, which I 100% appreciate. Um, how do we ensure all students receive appropriate amounts of e-learning? Again, I think, I think right now that would be more of a grade school concern since everybody else is going ingenuity. Right, um, and we have established some systems that we would use to um, have some more quality assurance. Uh, across the, the different pieces of what that would look like. So yes, certainly um, that was one of the areas for growth of improvement from uh, remote learning from the spring to remote learning 2.0. Okay, and then my other one you also touched on, it said, I had what if a kid starts e-learning but then finds the need in school instead, or vice versa. And I think that if we, if we as a district decide to keep two grading periods, I think I think that's okay. So I think you kind of already touched on that. But again, it's one of those things that I think you really need to drill into parents. Right, especially for ingenuity classes because you will be in a different spot in your biology ingenuity class than you would be jumping into a face-to-face -face instruction ingenuity class. So we need to be really careful that, and to jump in halfway through an ingenuity course, that also would be very problematic because it doesn't reset and now I'm just in the October through January version of that. So yes, we'll have to be, and the, the forms that we've created have it in several places, so I'm hoping, but. <laughs> yeah, so while you're talking ingenuity, so we, I am familiar with it. Mm -hmm. So there are several questions. I know that there's, there's a thing going around about football and taking online classes, and I know that Batavia mm -hmm. said one thing and some s districts haven't said anything at all. And I know that at my district, 
if you take an ingenuity course because it's not taught by a, a content, content teacher, it's not NCAA approved. So just for those of you who are and have D1 athletes, because I also have one, you have to be yeah, – I assume that the NCAA will loosen up their standards. But they haven't yet, and they, we're trying. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and I 100% know full well how hard his senior year when it was when he only really needed one credit, mm -hmm. and he still had to take, you know what I mean? Right. So I just want people to be aware, too, of your choices. And if you are planning on going, you know, outside of playing sports in college, I guess. Um, my only other big one, I mean, I have several, but we're, I won't spend all night on me. Um, planning time for staff. Mm -hmm. And I know that you and I talked about it. Right. And I think that whether we do the A, B days, staff still needs time to pull it together. Because e-learning point 1.0 was kind of a lesson for everybody. And right. we did some things really well, and we did some things where we could have improved a little bit. Right. So... I think that we need training, and I think that they need time to work together. Right, mm -hmm. and um, one of the benefits, especially of the junior high in-person schedule, is that the teachers are teaching all collectively and then have common lunch and planning after the students leave, which we've never had an opportunity to have common planning time before across you know, multiple content areas and teams. So we feel good about it that at the junior high level. At the elementary level, by shortening it a little bit, that has given more common planning time. The high school piece is a little bit more difficult because it's all day, but half the students. To help out with the high school piece and then the rest of the district will also get it too. The state has said we can use five remote learning planning days to help with that. Um, we are choosing not to use those up right before school starts um, and instead scatter them into those Mondays where those off days into the first two or three weeks of school so that we get into it a little bit, realize some more of what the obstacles are and then give people time and team time to do that. Right. So, and I think optimistically, we're thinking maybe just a semester of this. Eh? I said optimistically. <laughs> I said optimistically. But I, like, I the think other thing we have to kind of think that we might be doing this all this year. This is just going <laughs> to make it. But. I miss my kids too. But, like, I, I think that also everybody needs to remember that your old normal is not, no. it's gone. It's it's gone for the foreseeable future. So I, I hear a lot of parents talking about, we need to get back to normal. It's not going to happen. No. Right. Your normal is gone. Like, this Correct. is the new. Can you clarify, I'm sorry, okay. I, while you're talking about your remote session, you guys were talking about edgenuity. Yeah. And where you spoke of kids being possibly way ahead on ingenuity versus what the classroom is going to, to be at. Why can not or why are they not tied together specifically? Or why do we not have your, mm. your biology class at the high school that's in session with the 13 students that are remote learning integrated into the same classroom time at the same teacher? Right, and we are slowing down some of the ingenuity pieces so that you couldn't zoom through on independent time as much but it is not the exact duplicate of content and activities in ingenuity as it is a face-to-face -face class. It's a, like a different text. It's different in how they teach it. It's different in the order that they teach it. So your high school is now, I mean, I, I assume that they're both next-gen standards, mm -hmm. but they may teach them in a different order. So you may already cover genetics, but ingenuity might do it at the beginning, and you might not do it until the second semester. And that's a good idea? Well, to have pre-made courses and to have that going while we're doing face-to-face -face teach. Otherwise, um, like at the elementary level, as long as I have a few first, second, third grade teachers to help with that, I can pull. But to do remote classes and in-face for AP chemistry by all of the courses that are available, I can build a remote learning piece. I shouldn't use I. We could build remote learning if everybody shut down and we said, but to do face to face and build the, all the remote learning options, I don't see a way for us to do that without using a program or courses that are already built. Because that would basically be asking the teachers to do two jobs at the same time. Simultaneously. Right. Correct. Um, I wanted to bring up the question that I didn't see in the presentation, but I think there's a lot of great thinking in the presentation as far as the choices. Um, 
what we saw in the first survey was about, meh, the highest was 20% high school wants to be online. Um, was there anything that you guys considered about boosting the help for the nurses across the district to have, I mean, it's, it's a legitimate question when there's a health crisis on and we go along with what we have right now and that is very thin for those nurses. They work very hard to keep all the kids up to date on all the medical needs that they have. Even if we offered something like paraprofessional help and then we have you know, deployed it somewhere in the district for them to have those people. Are we looking at personnel to see where we could come up with a boost for the nurses? One of the things that we've been talking about uh, with the nurses piece, you'll have school nurse life as always. Um, I'm from elementary world, so we speak about um, lost teeth, wet pants, blood, and all that kind of stuff that would normally go to the nurse. And then you have mm -hmm. COVID-19. So we've been working and have begun conversations of what can classroom teacher handle or what can classroom teacher let the, the office know that I need an extra assist of hands that isn't a nurse set of hands. But teachers already do a large part of that. I know they, well, they say if it's, you, need an you assist. know. You know, if you've got a first grader that has a really, that has a bloody nose and they need help managing <coughs> it, but I'm teaching math to the rest of the first graders, right. don't necessarily need the expertise of the health professional, but you do need an extra set of hands, which is helping the nurse and helping the classroom teacher. So we're trying to, you know, find our best ways um, to do that. We also have started making a list with some of these options. You are going to have some more paraprofessional support available at different times of the day that you hadn't all you you wouldn't have normally had, like at the junior high schedule where it ends. Right. Then you've got some time to be able to offer assistance to that and we're right. making a list of what are all of our um, measurable flexible resources of time and money and space to be able to yeah I want to uh, stress that option more than the teacher lean option because the teachers going to have quite a bit to do and I know that we stress that already in the schools we say you know unless it's really bad don't send them to the nurse so yeah can I ask um one of the things that I didn't see mentioned was band and choir. Yes, so um, we are uh, exploring the option most very recently of not having band and choir in the typical manner. Um, so we actually started conversations and looking at that um, today as to not having that be available in its traditional sense. So that band and choir as a period in the day would still happen, but we could do things uh, about rhythm practice. We still could do music theory. We still could do um, all of those different pieces that don't involve the blowing of instruments um, and choir. I am a former drum major. I was in band forever. That is really hard conversation to, you know, to think about. And yet, when more and more research comes out about how it is spread and how all of those things, we need to look at that. So I don't have a definitive answer, but I know that parents making the choice are gonna wanna have that definitive answer. So we're checking with some other people and that will be part of the FAQ that comes out to junior high and high school. Thank you, because that was in my notes to mention and I didn't get there. Can I ask one more senior related question? Um, what if, I know on one of these slides you said, um, that seniors, so if they, if a senior chooses to do online learning, but they, let's say that the senior only needs English and one other credit, what's the, um, drawing a blank because my kids are out now, um, government? Uh, well, it depends on what they have oh, the, the civics requirement? Or yeah, the civics requirement okay. and the ELA. So what if that's all they need? and like the rest of their schedule right now is PE and electives. Can oh, they, I mean in this environment, could they choose to graduate early, get that done and be done? We'd have to work through the counselors just like we do in face-to-face -face pieces or what are those different options? But we're not holding people to a higher course requirement in remote than we would in face-to-face. -face. Okay, so if they only need say four classes to graduate, they could theoretically get it done for semester. Right, if that option is currently available in face-to-face, -face, we would make the same option available in remote. Okay. Right. Um, I, so just out of, so the four to five hours of combined learning activities and instruction, um, are those 
um, and you had mentioned videos. Is the how do we have a sense of how much of that it might is live um, instruction or interactive? Right, the ingenuity courses huh. those would not be live right. mm -hmm. teachers. That's working through. Um, much like you would take an online class. Now, we're going to have some of our staff that is assigned to that to help with questions, to see whether people are making progress, to take daily attendance, to talk about assessments. But there isn't going to be a lot of live District 308 teachers because I've got the live 308 teachers right. teaching. What about for um, the elementary? At the elementary, we are wanting to have, and we've um, built a, a schedule on what it looks like that it wouldn't. It might not be the exact same teacher that is providing math, reading, science, social studies as we share and conquer and divide that up. But there would be video time. We're encouraging uh, there to be a live piece that's social emotional learning so I can connect and talk with you. But for, I'm going to explain how multiplication works to record that so that families can watch it when it's convenient to do that and have asynchronous or if I need to watch it twice, because fractions are tough when I'm doing homework, I can watch it twice, I can put on closed caption, I can translate it to Spanish. So that piece when it is teacher talking and giving the lecture, mm -hmm. we want that to be a recorded video that is available for lots of time mm -hmm. and, and repetition, but saving that discussion piece for the social emotional connection for live pieces. But there would be a lot more SD 308 teacher video. Mm -hmm. And then how would like um, like gifted ed services work like in the elementary school? Um, yeah. So in person or remote? Um, both. Okay. <laughs> so um, in person, much like when we talked about special education or English learner services, those students would still be pulled out to receive services with their gifted mm -hmm. teacher to be able to do that. Um, they all have their own classrooms already, so you know we would socially distance down the hallway, meet with those students, much like you would an intervention for uh, reading or for special ed. Um, with the remote piece, we also envision there being that higher level of math. Um, reading and writing is a little bit easier to promote to the next level. But for the math pieces, we do envision that we would still have that advanced uh, math instruction for our students that are in gifted education in elementary. And then um, did you say um, uh, regarding for if, if parents chose the um, remote learning option and their child qualified for uh, or could get um, special education services, what did you, did you say? So we will still be providing those through teletherapy or okay. other sort of services on how we would do that. We um, want to make all of our options available for all students, but especially if you think about some of our medically fragile students also tend to be some of our students mm -hmm. that need those resources. Uh, and our philosophy has been if we are building it for one, we might as well build it for many to give that option. Okay. I had a question about the PE. Um, element and I'm curious as to why we're having the junior high do remote PE but not the high school like what is the so um, some of the differences as you see kind of working kindergarten through 12th grade mm -hmm. is that importance uh, that came out in the guidelines of having students that are 12 and under come to school for as much in-person instruction as we can so one of the things of trying to get all students in to the school at the junior high level is what can I give to be able to have a shortened day and get them um, through what they need to be. And PE, because it is problematic of having all students. So we already were trying to work with, we're gonna have all students coming in for junior high to think about all students in a gym class. Became much problematic where high school, we were saying we're flipping and you have half as many so that we could figure out how to do it was really that back to the scale, trying to have as much in-person instruction for all students on a daily basis weighed heavier at elementary and junior high than it did at high school. I guess I'm just wondering if, if for the high school they can't even change out, which means that we can't have them do any activities where they would be sweating. Um, why? Why? 
Does that include public speaking? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. I just, I was told that that, is, like, if, if they're not changed out, they're, like, can't sweat or something. But, I don't if, know. but if we dropped PE, you could fit in plan time at the end of the day. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think we should consider <laughs> a remote PE option, and then they're actually getting some One physical One of the things, fitness. and so um, let, uh, let me admire the problem with you for yes. just a little bit. <laughs> If you drop PE, that's also redoing every single high school student's schedule because it's at different places in the day and shortening that. And as we thought about, can we redo the high school schedule like we did with junior high, which is going to be a, a, challenge. a challenge. But if you think about redoing it for all high school students of what their schedules would be to start taking out periods, we explored that for several days. Uh, and then, or like to recreate the schedules and rethink about what everybody's taking at this late of game just did not seem, and I pushed for us to explore that a, a possibility. And the elementary kids don't change it. The older ones are, get a little stinky. And uh, the good news is we have masks on so you can't smell. <laughs> as easily as you would have, That's but I, I don't think we need to worry. I think they can Anybody still sweat in high school in the to the extent <laughs> to which they are willing to sweat for PE. Um, another, as a parent of a student who lives for band, like literally that's all he cares about. Um, I know that you struggle through those choices and I hope that we would consider some sort of perhaps an after-school opt-in option for some type of concert band and choir. Perhaps we could utilize Old Trauber. They have some large spaces in there where there's much greater opportunity to spread out. And there are programs. There are electronic programs where the band can sync up and play together and well, choir too, use, right? They already use yeah, those right. well, smart music programs. So. I would echo that also, particularly when you're looking at um, the junior high option for remote or for regular, really. Um, junior high is when they learn the skills that they need to be successful in high school at these pursuits. So it would be really challenging for me to be comfortable with them not being able to continue with at least a remote option mm -hmm. to continue to practice. Was the band part of the junior high not for remote consideration? It's still it's an elective. Part, part of their thing. So I, I think it's, you, you, you kind of mentioned uh, theory yeah. as one. Right. If Even if there was some sort of elective or some other sort of performance piece to it, as long as we they can still, still have theory. They would still have that in their schedule to be able to you know, work on the things that they can work on, whether it's rhythms, whether it's talking about, you know, on down day, whether it's talking about all those musical terms. and, and But it wouldn't be practice on the tuba. Right. Um, and it wouldn't be an option for students using edgenuity. Correct. And that's that's where my, my concern lies. Right. That if they use smart music for practicing now, um, is there a way to, to include that for remote that's students? That's one of the discussions that we were having today about right. how to do that piece and open that up to other people. Because I did see that on the guidelines that were sent, which maybe they're imminently changing and I don't know, but it did have an exclusion for wearing a face covering while playing an instrument. So, right. I, right, I think as we've learned a little bit more just recently about it being airborne, we're gonna see a little bit more of that possibly change in what's coming. Um, are we going to be doing, how will this impact some of our, the drills that we do, you know, the safety? So, um, one of the, we are going to be looking at that. Uh, that's on uh, the docket <laughs> for, you know, how do we make sure that we're being safe, but do more of the minimal requirements of what we need that to be. And then if we do do fire drills at the high school level, we can't all pick A days because then only the A students will have practiced. <laughs> But it will be important as we think about, we've changed hallway guidance, we've changed it, you know, what is urgent and you have to get out of the building, may not be six foot distant. You know, we have to work all of that out and I am not prepared to speak um, specifically of how we would do those drills other than it is on the list to figure out um, what all those different requirements would be with social distancing and what in-person instruction would look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then 
then, sorry, one oh. other question. Um, so subs, right? I mean, you had talked about there, this, there's this uh, chance, you know, that we may have um, enough staff out that, um, you know, we have to pivot to remote learning for whatever amount of time that might be in a certain area or, or, or school or whatnot. Um, but, you know, subs, I know, I, I think, have been an issue, uh, have been a challenge mm -hmm. for us. Um, so I thought one of the ideas was that we were sort of a lower paying sub district and I'm wondering if so we have been exploring that uh -huh. um, and I don't know if you want me to no yeah, we've been talking about that <laughs> and we will be upping upping the pay Ken's, Ken's done uh, some uh, surge pricing and the different things over the years mm -hmm. and uh, we're ready to be competitive with it without actually spending more money we got right. some good no, ideas yeah. yeah that's awesome that's mm -hmm. wonderful I know how he's does his good analysis and everything. So, I mean, that's a helpful, that you, one would hope, you know, that will be helpful, but um, but then also knowing with our surrounding districts too, that subs could are going to be potentially a real hot commodity with um, all the different health concerns, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Is internal subbing going to, con would, continue or be so we do some of the internal subbing where we pay just so everybody understands what we're talking about uh, so especially at the junior high and high school period you may have your second period off and you're trying to get coverage of classes uh, so you may say hey can you go over and do the sub plans for second you know second period and then we pay staff for that piece we anticipate that we will still need some of those options uh, as, as we move forward. So I think that practice will continue. Uh, even at the elementary level, sometimes you pay people to work through their planning time if they are wanting to do that. That isn't something that we require staff to do. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate their willingness to do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you want an order? You, I, I'm good. Yeah. Um, I would like to visit um, PE a little bit more. Um, there's a lot of focus on it. There's there's a full page on it, remote, in person, fall, winter. Is there an option? Have you explored it? Can is it we talk about waivers for PE for, for different other activities? Considering what's going on, is it an option to waive PE requirements at all for this upcoming year and not worry about fitting it into the schedule as well as social distancing and the masks and one of why the, are we even um, ironic things about um, working in public education in Illinois is that PE is the only subject that is required daily I don't have to teach reading on a daily basis mm -hmm. or math on a daily basis but PE is required even through all of this is there any there hasn't conversation been anything mm -hmm. Any leeway or, or different guidance into what that looks what, like? What is the minimum requirement to satisfy to say that PE was taught in a day? Uh, there's an actual minute number for the elementary. For junior high and high school, it's just that you're enrolled in a PE course. Um, and the understanding is that the traditional segmented day, so it's equal amount of time and as the other. Is 10 minutes of yoga considered PE? That's a, not to be sarcastic yeah. here, but that's a great question for State Senator Linda Holmes because she wrote the law that requires school districts in Illinois to have a minimum number of minutes per day. So, I mean, that I would, I would be interested. What is the minimum, and are we just shooting for the minimum, especially on something like PE right now in this in this platform that we're trying to to work through? Um, kind of including of PE at the elementary level, well, there was some reduced uh, time for specials, music, art, library, and PE. Um, is there any consideration to even reducing it even further? I, I would think that that population is going to be the most, um, I don't want to say troublesome, but I, I think uh, staff ought to be more creative in working with social distancing in masks and as important as it may be to have them in the building, maybe even condensing the time a little bit more. 
so maybe an option. Um, one of the complexities of the elementary day is the way that elementary teachers get their planning time or their break time is through other teachers teaching PE, music, art, or library. So as we worked through of diminishing some of the PE, music, art, and library time, we still had to make sure that our staff were getting breaks every day to be able to have time to plan, but also just to have a break. So there isn't a way, at least I wasn't smart enough to figure that out, to diminish it a lot more and still give our teachers planning time and still have a, a length of a, of a day for our students to attend. You could dramatically shorten the student day, but that's certainly not what our community said that they wanted. And one last question. Maybe I missed it, but um, with junior high being the age group that seems to be losing the most time in the course of a day, historically it seems like that's where a lot of students were lost or they, they fell behind. Why is it that the junior high age group was uh, reduced the most? So the actual instructional minutes for science and social studies and all that kind of stuff is exactly the same with this new piece. In fact, our science teachers are kind of excited because instead of having 41 minutes to put a lab together and then you know, take it apart and do all that stuff, now they have a double period to block. be able to get through those. There's things. no transition, right? Correct. Right. Yeah. So they're actually getting more right. time. The group that we're going to have to really work on is our ELA teachers because they are losing some time. But built into that day was in time for independent reading and time for writing, which is much more of an independent, isolated type of a thing, which we felt we could push outside of the school day. And I fibbed. I did have one more question. Okay. The remote piece. Um, I think I'm understanding ingenuity a little bit more. Okay. And I think that goes contradictory to what, I, from what I felt I heard from most families is that the piece they did not like most about the remote learning option in the spring or what happened was the lack of interaction with an instructor, with, with the teacher and the students relying on just content that was there. Do you foresee that still being an issue moving forward with the new I think if they are looking for a hand over hand person, they're, they're still going to be that um, loss because it is still going to be in much more independently driven than if you're sitting in a classroom and I'm saying, come on, you need to keep going. Um, but it is built so that there are instructional videos and those pieces of that instruction, not just here's an assignment. So I think there will be an improvement in that piece, but I do not believe it will replace the, the motivation necessarily or um, the check for understanding that a live teacher would have. It gives you a little progress bar at the bottom. Yes. My question is, now that you've made this big plan, which I think is a good big plan, are you going to go to the high school, junior high, and elementary teachers and people that work with the kids and break it down into these are activities that are going to be f a better at keeping kids safe and healthy, and these are activities that aren't? Because, for example, in elementary school, I sing all the time, and the idea I know is that I should not be singing this next year unless I'm an online teacher, right? Um, are you going to give people some guidance because I think – that classroom teachers want to know what it should look like in person to so keep kids safe. at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, okay. <laughs> um, I have uh, a group of teachers and, uh, and administrators that we're going to start tackling. And we actually started working on it last week, too. But what are some of the things that we need to put in place for especially that in-person piece? Right. Um, not only the professional development, but what are some of our best practices on what that would look like? How are we going to assess kids at the beginning of the year? to kind of figure out where they're at from March. How are we going to determine what are the really need to know standards and what are the nice to know standards that we can relax? You know, some of those pieces. How are we going to talk to students about all the social emotional piece? I didn't have, it's not part of this presentation, but we have a whole lot of people that are working on surveys and things to give our families about what what a special difficulties they are coming back to school with regarding social emotional pieces, how to talk about all of this, how to talk about hand washing, how to talk about all of those things. Mask that in-person instruction is going to be 
needing to take on in addition to all of the academic pieces that we've normally done. Okay. Because I think the teachers need that guidance. I think they feel a lot of pressure and they feel a lot of guilt and responsibility for keeping kids safe. And when the district doesn't say to them, hey, here are some choices that are going to lean you in the right direction. Here are some choices that probably you need to stay away from, at least for this year. Um, that's going to give teachers a sense of confidence going back. I really want to applaud this district for getting all of this done early so that teachers have time to think, figure out what they're going to do and to know who's going to be online and who's going to be not. And I hope that we really lean on finding some way to help those people who don't feel safe at work because... You know, that's a real concern, and the stress that that causes a person to have to go to work when they really don't feel safe is, is an issue. So I hope that I'm not going to hear stories as a board member of people coming back to work in a pressure situation where they didn't really want to do that thing. And I want, I'm want i glad you mentioned that, Tony, because um, I, I have a lot of other questions, but I'm going to email them. <laughs> um, but I wanted to say, I wanted to make sure, because we've received a lot of questions and a lot of concerns from teachers about what things will look like for them and about their safety and about some of the liability things and, um, a lot, you know, a lot of different things. And so, um, you know, in the interest of time, um, I, you know, I think my questions will, will be better served um, being sent via email, but I do want the teachers in this district to know that we're think that that we're aware of the questions and concerns that they have, um, and we'll be you know following up with right. And all I'm, of you. I'm glad that you kind of gave me that opening because I know I have lots of staff that are watching this too, mm -hmm. and this presentation was more into how do we describe all of these things for parents. There's obviously many, many, many questions about sick leave, about all of those pieces that we need to address to staff. Mm -hmm. But this was really set, this presentation was about what are the choices for parents so we can get the selection form out so we can get parents to make decision to build all of that. Right. Um, there will be lots of communication. I've already, my team and I are already doing our weekly communication to staff, uh, our weekly communication to administration. and. As we started last year, we talked about relationships or the foundation of learning. Relationships don't happen unless you have good communication and trust. So we're going to have to really double down, just like we did in the spring, about communication about everything moving forward. Thank you. I'm going to just, I have one final question, unless anyone else has anything else that they do not feel comfortable emailing. Um, we have one of our show choir directors here, and we've just heard extensively in public hearing, um, show choir is a great way to do PE. So I'm going to go ahead and recommend that we consider that uh, TikTok videos have been a, <laughs> a great way for kids to be active right. and um, do I, music at the same I, time. I laugh because <laughs> right the idea actually. It did. It, no, <laughs> no, really. Uh -huh. uh -huh. yeah. Great. You, you can create a problem solving. Kind of brainstorming that might. Oh, I'm quite certain. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Right. I mean, it works for show choir. So. <laughs> Thank you again very much. Again, um, as Faith mentioned, there will be extensive communication coming forward in the next few days. There were things that were not answered. They will be answered. There is a procedure if your specific question has not been answered so that it can be directed to the people best able to answer this. This is an undertaking of enormous proportions with 18,000 students and 2,500 plus staff. Um, and it will be something that we all need to work together on and, and I know that we'll continue to do so as a community. So thank you. What is the procedure? It is what it is <laughs> with TikTok. Yeah. I mean, like if people have questions that they want answered, do you? They will get that communication by Wednesday is what I heard. Correct. There's an a, a number that you can call and a form that just like in the spring will be answering almost 24-7. Okay, but we're going to send that out to them. Yes. Okay. We're sending it out to them because we want to make sure that as it comes, it gets directed to the person that has the best answers. Okay. Thank you. Is there going to be an on something on the website in case somebody were to say, I didn't get the email? I'm yes. quite certain it so will be addressed through all venues. Yes. Sure. I can't imagine. It'll have its own page on the try website. Try to yes. give everybody. Yes. It already does. Have yes. Listen, she's got, I know, man. But it is 1025, and we have things to do still. And 
and I encourage all of those questions to be directed appropriately to the right people. Okay, action items. Item 9.1, are there any questions about bills for payment? Can I have a motion? I make a motion to authorize the payment of bills in the amount of $7,829,365.81 as presented. Second. Mrs. Swanson? Aye. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Ms. Morgan? Aye. Mrs. Kroner? Aye. Mr. Bauman? Aye. Mrs. Moyer? Aye. Mr. Lightfoot? Aye. Motion passes 7-0, item 9.2, approval of submission of waive, state waiver application for show choir. Any questions? I think we have one. <laughs> I just want to say that I want to thank Mr. Thierry and Tina Gonzalez for coming by to the meeting tonight and spending the entire meeting listening to a lot of petitions by impassioned supporters of this particular item of getting show choir uh, PE waiver. Uh, Tina does a lot of the costuming for the show choir and Mr. Thierry of course is the director. I've seen their performances and I think you know we've heard enough of the great stuff so I'll keep it at that but thank you for coming to the meeting and staying for the whole meeting. We look forward to your workout videos. <laughs> <laughs> With come on Eileen and I feel for you. It's remote learning. I make a motion to approve the resolution authorizing the submission of a state waiver application to exempt a student participating in show choir from participating in physical education. Second. Mrs. Kroner? Aye. Mr. Lightfoot? Aye. Mrs. Moyer? Aye. Mr. Bauman? Aye. Mrs. Swanson? Aye. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Ms. Morgan? Aye. <laughs> motion passes 7-0. <laughs> Item 9.3. I make, I make a motion to approve a three-year contract for regular education transportation services with an option for a two-year extension with First Student, Inc. Second. Ms. Morgan? Aye. Mr. Lightfoot? Aye. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Swanson? Aye. Mr. Bauman? Aye. Mrs. Moyer? Aye. Mrs. Kroner? Aye. Motion passes 7-0, item 9.4. I make a motion to approve a three-year contract for special education transportation services with an option for a two-year extension with SEPTRAN. Second. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Ms. Morgan? Aye. Mr. Lightfoot? Aye. Mrs. Moyer? Aye. Mrs. Kroner? Aye. Mrs. Swanson? Aye. Mr. Bauman? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Item 9.5. I make a motion to approve the ambulance service agreement between Oswego CUSD 308 and the Oswego Fire Protection District as presented. Second. Hey, I have a quick question on this one. So, Sorry. God forbid you have football players. There is no football season. We don't pay for we what don't we don't pay. use. Just clarifying. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Just checking. Mrs. Moyer? Aye. Mr. Lightfoot? Aye. Ms. Morgan? Aye. Mrs. Swanson? Aye. Mrs. Kroner? Aye. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mr. Bauman? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Item 9.6. I just want to thank Mrs. Patterson for working through some of the language. I think it um, seems much more up to date. <laughs> I make a motion to approve the intergovernmental agreement to provide a school resource officer to Oswego High School and Oswego East High School for a period of two years. Second. Mrs. Kroner? Aye. Mrs. Swanson? Aye. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Moyer? Aye. Mr. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Lightfoot? Aye. Ms. Morgan? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. On the next item, I'm going to not be voting. I make a motion to approve the settlement and release agreement as presented. Second. Ms. Morgan? Aye. Mr. Lightfoot? No. Mrs. Moyer? Aye. Mrs. Kroner? Aye. Mrs. Swanson? No. Mr. Bauman? Aye. Motion passes for two. Item 9.8. 
I make a motion to approve the building administrator contracts as presented. Second. Ms. Morgan? Aye. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Moyer? Aye. Mrs. Croner? Aye. Mr. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Lightfoot? Aye. Mrs. Swanson? Aye. Motion passes 7-0, item 9.9. .9. I make a motion to approve the personnel report as presented. Second. Mrs. Moyer? Aye. Mr. Lightfoot? Aye. Ms. Morgan? Aye. Mrs. Swanson? Aye. Mrs. Croner? Aye. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mr. Bauman? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Can I have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.